States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everyone. Tonight we have a slight adjustment to our normal agenda. And item 1.02 is the swearing in of Mrs. Amy Hayden, who joins us after the appointment meeting uh, we held last month. There's one thing I didn't get to say at that meeting, Mrs. Hayden, that I wanted to share, and that is uh, board members present here tonight, if your first service on the board was through an appointment, could you raise your hand so I can see all of them? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, you're in good company. Uh, so. It's an amazing thing when someone steps forward to serve their community, as you have. Thank you, uh, on the bottom of all of our hearts and on behalf of the entire Pine Richland community. Mr. Palmer. solemnly swear or affirm do solemnly swear or affirm that I will support defend and obey that I will support defend and obey the Constitution of the United States of America the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania and that I will discharge the duties of my office and that I will discharge the duties of my office with fidelity with fidelity Congratulations again, Ms. Hayden. Ms. Williams, roll call. Thank you. Mr. Lyons? Here. <coughs> Mrs. Misbach? Here. Mr. Kashani? Here. Mr. DiTulio? Here. Mrs. Hayden? Here. Dr. Mihalik? Here. Dr. Meyer? Here. Mr. Moy? Here. Mrs. Swope? Here. Thank you. Thank you. We now have two strategic plan updates uh, prior to the recognition of visitors. Dr. Okay. Miller. Yep, thank you. Uh, so this may be one of our last updates of the educational model and plan for this year. And you can see from the title, Mr. Stobener, if you could pull that up. Thank you. That today we put transforming the future also on the title slide. And the next agenda item is actually focused directly on uh, what the 21-22 school year may look like. Uh, but we included it in the title here because we're nearing that point of transition as we head into next year. So I'll focus only on a couple new points tonight uh, in the presentation. This will not be turned into a podcast, but we will put a copy of this presentation on the district website in the COVID-19 section. The first point we wanted to emphasize tonight is just really acknowledging the realities of the disruption to school and life that have occurred since March of 2020. It is incredible to think about what has occurred in schools, in our community, in our society over the last 14 months. To think about the fact that we have about 800 students, 800 students who have not walked into one of our schools for 14 months. We have another 3,800 students who have adjusted with staff members to various instructional approaches based upon what's happening in the conditions and cases. It's incredible to think about that. We have found a variety of rhythms, right? Every family finds their own rhythm. Staff members become used to the conditions and, and what does the instructional model look like? But it's different. And as we prepare for next fall, there's going to be a significant period of transition, not only based on what's happening with COVID-19, but just as we get ourselves back into, hopefully, what will be much more like what we're traditionally used to. So that's a tremendous stressor. You know, we all carry stress in different ways. Our students feel it, our parents feel it, our community feels it. And, and this is one of those periods of time where it feels like one layer of stress or something is happening and, and it builds on another. It's just a lot. 
And so, again, we want to express incredible appreciation to our students, to our parents, to our staff, and to our community to be able to deliver a model that is still focused on learning. Some students are thriving, some are struggling, but we're working hard together to try to make the absolute best out of a challenging circumstance, and we're appreciative of that. Athletics and activities have continued all year. Again, these are just some examples, but we have to have an eye in the future. We want to make sure our community knows we're thinking about our students, we're thinking about our staff, and we're thinking about what that might feel like as we return in the fall of 21. Uh, again, our current path, what's in place right now, should we believe take us through uh, the rest of this year. Uh, so we can see here, after a slight increase over the last six weeks, the last couple weeks we've started to see a decline again in cases. And it continues to reinforce that what's happening in the community is what we see in schools. They're almost identical in terms of, of cases and, and conditions. Uh, we see an update here of year to date. And last time, this was the first time we added that column to the right, school-based quarantine. So one of the realities of our shift in model was that in certain cases, we have less than six feet of physical distancing. And when there's less than six feet of physical distancing, if we were to have a confirmed case in our school, then any students or people who were within six feet for 15 minutes or more would, be, would qualify as close contacts and have a period of quarantine. That's true for us. It's true for everybody in Allegheny County. It's true for everybody in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. There's no different definition. And so what we see on the right is the current as of today, and that changes you know, based upon sort of rolling windows. But we see at the high school, for example, there's 38 students who are in quarantine. These are healthy students placed in quarantine because they were a close contact of someone who became confirmed positive. For most of the year, based on our model, we did not have to deal with quarantine very often. It was very rare that we had quarantine based upon school-based contacts. If there was quarantine, it was usually because of a family situation or a community-based activity. Uh, but now we see a little bit more, but we're, we are pleased with the relative low numbers. This, but this is a function of our slight shift in model. So again, the quarantine and the, the requirements are no different for us than for anybody else. It's now 10 days without testing, or if you get a test on day five and it's negative, you can return after day seven. So those are the same rules that apply uh, everywhere. We added a bullet at the bottom about positive antibody tests. So that's another component that people can check out if that's relevant for uh, a particular family. And you see also fully vaccinated people do not need to quarantine. And this will become more and more important as we begin to see not just the staff, but students who have been vaccinated as well. So we're gonna see more and more of this uh, as we go forward. Uh, so again, the, the Pfizer vaccine is available for students 16 or older. So we're beginning to see students uh, vaccinated. Again, that's a family decision and a choice, but we're seeing more and more of that. And we can also expect that younger age levels will be approved at some point, and so we will just see more and more of that in the way uh, things happen within schools. Last week, we had our 16th Healthcare Leadership Council meeting of the year. Uh, we anticipate that was our last planned meeting for the current school year, but as we get into the summer and we see how things are progressing, we will reconvene that team. Mrs. Hayden, on that, we have about 43 people on the Healthcare Leadership Council, 12 of whom are in the healthcare sector. They're physicians, they're, they work in the pharmacies, they, in, in almost all manners, and many of them have direct experience with COVID. They serve on that council and serve as a sounding board. Uh, they're vested, invested members of the community, many of whom have children in schools, some have graduates of, the, of Pine Richland. They have been an invaluable um, resource to the team, really appreciate their investment over the course of the year. But we asked them to, to think forward about what they're hearing and seeing. And again, it's a little bit premature to share that, uh, but they do uh, collectively anticipate greater vaccine supply as, it, as the expansion happens with younger ages that will have impact on, um, 
again, what that means for, for schools, and it's a little bit early to look at mitigation and what that might mean. And, and so again, a lot of moving parts, um, but really want to express much appreciation for the council and for our experts. And all of the other points uh, are similar to the past, uh, so I'll just stop there. Uh, Mr. Stobener, you can exit that. Uh, I wanted to see if there are any questions before we move into specifically the transforming the future piece. Okay, would you like this? Well, we aren't going to use the presentation, so I think we'll be okay just okay. speaking, so Good. that's, that's okay. great. So um, Mrs. Gearin is uh, here with me. Mr. Stobener, we're not on to that yet. Mrs. Gearin is here with me tonight as well. Um, she is the Pine Ridge Virtual Academy principal, and we have been working through, along with Mr. Huswet and the rest of the um, senior leaders, our plan for transforming the future. And part of that has been um, having a leadership council, on which we have members um, from the community, the staff, and students. Uh, we will be speaking to that in a minute and some of the stakeholder input we've gathered um, through surveys and then also meeting with student leaders at the various buildings to hear their experiences, uh, which was invaluable. But what we know is we are going to be offering a virtual model in the next school year and beyond. And we know that this is our small red star moment where we're going to improve upon what we've had in place. We've certainly learned a lot in a year's time. Um, it can only get better. We know that we can't take multiple steps uh, to the right and move on our continuum without um, giving it some additional thought and hearing from folks. So we did also want to scan the environment, and understand what our competitors in the um, cyber, cyber charter world uh, were doing that we could learn from and understand um, how what we have to offer compares to that and how we can improve. So I'm going to kick it over to Mrs. Gearin to explain um, some of the lenses that we looked through um, as we conducted that analysis and what conclusions we came to in terms of um, our viability for our programming in the future. Okay, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Paula Guerin. As Dr. Justice said, I'm the PRVA Pine Richland Virtual Academy principal this year. Um, before COVID, you could find me at Eden Hall as one of the assistant principals. So uh, I know I'm supposed to talk about the lenses and everything, but I'm a very positive person. And I just want to take a quick minute to bring out all of the highlights and positives that I can tell you about what's been happening so far in the virtual world at Pine Richland. So first of all, you know, with COVID, I feel like so many of us, we always think about the negative things that have happened. And if we take a step back and look at education, we can just see all of this amazing growth that our district has been going through this year. So um, when I think of COVID, I think of a positive thing. And I see how we are going to be able to transform the future and how we've already started that process this year. You know, PRVA didn't even exist 14 months ago. And now here we are using it kind of as a groundwork for what we're going to be doing in the future. Our biggest thing at PRBA, um, which focuses on just the K to six grade level, is um, from the very beginning, we said we're making history. This has never done, been done before. You know, we're setting the bar. And if we don't know how to, if something's going to work, we're going to try it once and we'll improve on it. And that's kind of been our mantra throughout the whole year, which is why I think it's been so successful. The students have picked up on that, you know, the first time they've been taking tests online or taking um, I mean, we all did the PSSAs online this year, so that was a huge jump. So um, the students and the staff have just been completely amazing. But the biggest thing is, is it's actually working. I know there's lots of people out there that may wonder, does virtual education work? And it does. Um, I have friends in other districts, and they actually laugh at me because they'll say, like, oh, this isn't working. And then they look at me, and they're like, but we know it works at Pine Richland because they hear me talk so much about how it actually does work. I mean, our students are learning. We have kids that are learning how to read for the very first time on an iPad. Um, we have, and I see Mrs. Bianca nodding her head and Dr. Paxian, like there are students that are excelling. The amount of progress they're making on um, IEP or GIEP goals is incredible. So it really is working. Uh, we have our technology skills. I always tell the students like the skills that they've learned, all of our students, but specifically I'm speaking for PRBA, that they've learned this year have, you know, they, it's already set them above other school districts and other peers that they will be, you know, eventually in the outside world with. The independence from a five-year-old up to a 12-year-old is unbelievable. It's the time management, the independence that they're building. And we're actually doing a lot more collaborative projects because we have to write lessons that are unique and the teachers have really been you know, coming up with unique, fun, engaging ways to get these students to get that socialization and work together. But just little things that I do um, as a leader is I look at our assessments. That's hard data points. And so I have pulled star assessments from classes of in-person students and star assessments from our PRVA students. 
And if I would get rid of the names, you would never be able to tell the difference. That's something that is great in my mind, that we can't say, oh, this student was a virtual student this year because they're you know, not growing as much as everybody else. So you really can't tell the model. Our parents are so supportive. Um, and I've seen that this is my third year in Pine Richland. Our parents are so supportive of our school district. And PRBA it has not, you know, dis they have not disappointed anything. They give me feedback. Um, they are just so supportive of our teachers, and we're very thankful for that. And last but not least, obviously, I can't go without mentioning our, the teachers, whether, you know, all Pine Richland teachers as well as our PRBA teachers specifically, since I work with them on a daily basis and it being Teacher Appreciation Week. They are knocking it out of the park. I started a thing, a monthly award that I give the students and parents nominate teachers for called the Grand Slam Rams, and they're highlighting teachers that are knocking it out of the park. And they, they truly are the resiliency. They're pouring their hearts into it. And to be honest, if I look back to day one, I have never heard a PRVA teacher complain about anything. And I think it's because they know we're like, this is all about taking risks and doing what's best for students. And we'll figure it out if it doesn't work because we're constantly looking for ways to improve. So I just want to give a little shout out out there to all of the teachers in Pine Richland for doing such a terrific job this year. Um, because of all this and because it's working well and we set the bar pretty high, we did, as Dr. Miller said and Dr. Justice, we, what, what are we going to do in the future? We have to, um, you know, put something into place. We have over 800 students that are doing this and they all have a little taste of what virtual works or how virtual is working for them. And, Again, it's not for every student, but some students are really excelling and for different family reasons, that's the option that they that they need. So, you know, rather than just saying, hey, it's working, we wanted to research the competitors that we have, the students that are going to different cyber programs outside of Pine Richland. So um, there was a small committee of us and we put together some different areas that we wanted to look into, which included things like demographics and staffing, instructional design, their support services and technology, um, performance indicators and extracurriculars, those are some of the main categories that we really did a lot of research. And rather than share a like 28 page document that we came up with, I'm just gonna summarize real quick. And I said this, we had um, a meeting last week and I remember I, whenever we were meeting with Dr. Miller and he was like, all right, Paula, so tell me, what, do you, what did you find from all this research? What do you think? And I was like, we are completely blowing them out of the water. And it's our first year ever doing this and we're in the middle of a pandemic. So if we can do all of this in the year of COVID, can you even imagine what we can do in the future? So I really think that we can transform the future here at Pine Richland. Some of the big things, um, for instance, PRVA or Pine Richland, a virtual academy there, can offer our consistent access to multiple support services. We know social emotional health is a huge thing every year, especially now and moving forward. And having those multiple support services that travel with the kids as they move through different grade levels from building to building is key in my mind. Also our MTSS system that we have in place and all of our interventions and enrichments, the students will be able to access those as if they were an in-person student. This blew my mind, synchronous versus asynchronous time. Currently our K-6 kids are on the computer for the same time that the in-person students are. And at first we all, you know, people were questioning like, how are you gonna get a five-year-old or 10-year-old to be on the screen that long? And let me tell you, I have a 17-year-old daughter, they have no problem being on a screen for eight hours, right, if we would let them. So I always told the teachers, we have to compete with Netflix, we have to compete with Roblox and Minecraft, and we have to be more engaging than those things. And it's working, these kids, they've built up their stamina, we know they can do it. So our synchronous, the amount of synchronous time that we have at the K to six level, and then even in the secondary when they're live streaming in, it's like, it's real school. And whenever we looked at this data, many of our competitors average one to two hours per week. So, you know, just looking at that in itself, I think was mind blowing. Um, also, I mentioned some of our assessments that we have. We can get multiple data points to make sure that what we're doing is working, um, whether it's a universal screener or diagnostic tests or um, again, through our MTSS program. Another one of my favorites that I hold near and dear to my heart are Ramsway. I mean, we have virtual Ramsway happening um, K-12. And, you know, it looks a little bit different than it does in person, but again, it's teaching these students life skills and um, it's something that we've just been able to continue. But the number one thing is that we would have Pine Richland teachers teaching the Pine Richland curriculum, and you can't beat that, right? You can't go to our competitors and get our rigorous curriculum taught to our students. 
these students, it would just be like they're in person, but now we're doing it online. So we consistently perform well above the you know top decile in the state and the competitors that we researched, they were on improvement plans at various stages. So just the rigor of the curriculum that we can bring to a virtual academy in the future. And as I mentioned at the beginning, like I feel like we've set the bar high and we know we've learned so many different things. And when COVID isn't an issue, things like bringing kids in for in-person socialization, you know, maybe they come in for an assembly or they come to participate in Science Olympiad or, you know, just getting them together because that is the one drawback on the computer. We've been, you know, trying to find different ways all year long to increase that peer-to-peer -peer socialization. But I have to tell you one shocking thing that came out this year is that the teachers said, and it's almost unanimous, the teachers agreed that they feel like they know the students better this year being virtual than they do when they're online. And that was something that was very shocking to me. And as we like dug a little bit deeper, you know, they see, and I always use this example, but they see like a baby brother growing up in the background. They're a little baby at the beginning of the year and they've seen them make their first, take their first steps. They see posters hanging around them so they know what their interests are. They just, the kids, you know, have that comfort level in their home. and. If they're talking about a pet, all of a sudden, before you know it, we have lizards being held up to the screen and if they're making the connections with the students. So it really has been an amazing experience and I can talk about this for hours, but I feel like oh. Mr. Stobiner would eventually just shut me off. So I know this model is not for everyone, but I know that we're transforming the future. That's something that I, I know that we're going to do with success and keep growing on it years to come. Thank you so much, Mrs. Yeah. Gear. We appreciate yeah. your leadership tremendously. And what we will be doing going forward, we have a um, third um, Transforming the Future Leadership Council on um, the 12th of May. And we have an internal committee meeting on the 10th to look at the staffing models, the how. We have a very clear why. So now it becomes around the number of students that are interested in how we deliver those models and, and in which ways. So we're working with the staff on that um, collaboratively and we'll bring additional updates in the future. Um, I just want to say that you know, what you're doing is really impressive. Um, doing virtual learning well is, is a challenging task. And what I've seen here, you know, being in education, I've seen how cyber schools function. And they're right. They may see their teacher once or one or two hours a week. So the fact that they're seeing their teachers at this mail and that they're learning and they're interacting is just amazing. And it is, you know, an, an opportunity for students who might otherwise choose to be virtual for whatever reason. So just really good stuff. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Item 1.05 is recognition of visitors. Peter. Sorry, Mark. Would you mind if I uh, said a few words? Please. Right now? So I think it's important for us to address why we're holding this meeting like we are right now as opposed to in another venue. And uh, so I think it's important for everyone listening um, to understand that this board is united on many things, but not the least of which is this, that we love this district, we love this community, and we love the kids. We're all parents, we're all taxpayers, we volunteer our time and our energy and our gifts to serve every stakeholder. We have to make difficult, pragmatic decisions. And that responsibility weighs heavy on our minds and on our hearts. Our motives are pure. They're not rooted in personal or political agendas. They're not rooted in anger, in hate, in bitterness, in envy, in impatience or revenge or fear. They're rooted in love. We all humbly know this is not about us. It's something much bigger. It's about something much bigger than any one person. Those that know me know I love Mr. Rogers. And to paraphrase Mr. Rogers, love is a four-letter word. And what ultimately matters is what we do with it. And I feel that those of us on this board and the administration are chosen 
to be servants. It doesn't matter what our particular role is. We're chosen to help meet the deeper needs of those we serve day and night. To those in our community who have been unable to control their emotions, we're sorry that you're so angry. And we're saddened, deeply saddened, by what's happened. We all have learned to respectfully disagree without being disagreeable. So our meetings have two primary purposes, to hear the public and to conduct the business of the board. And we have received a few, a few requests to hold this meeting in the auditorium and to do that with appropriate distancing where everyone attending in person and online could hear and be heard is no small feat. So therefore, we mutually decided to retain the live stream format for the public which has been our practice throughout this pandemic. So we understand not everybody will like that decision, but it won't stop us to love you, our neighbors. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you, Mark. Uh, before we move to the recognition of visitors, uh, Mr. Palmer. Thank you, Mr. Lyons. Um, I wanted to provide a few comments relative to school, school board policy 903, which relates to public participation in board meetings. The purpose of that policy, as stated in the policy itself, is that the board recognizes the value to school governance of public comment on educational issues and the importance of involving members of the public in board meetings. The board also recognizes its responsibility for proper governance of the district and the need to conduct its business in an orderly and efficient manner. To that end, the policy provides that each statement made by a participant shall be limited to three minutes in duration. The portion of the meeting during which the public is invited to speak shall be limited to 60 minutes. All statements by members of the public should be directed to the presiding officer. Uh, no participant may address or question board members individually. And finally, the board officer, the presiding officer as the board president, may interrupt or terminate a participant's statement when the statement is too lengthy, personally directed, abusive, obscene, or irrelevant. Um, I'd ask speakers to keep those points in mind as they address the board. Uh, the board very much wants to hear public comments. Uh, we'd like to do it in an orderly and respectful manner. Thank you, Mr. Palmer. Uh, with that said, Mr. Stobener. Mr. Crawford, you're on with the board. Thank you for letting me on the agenda tonight. I'll get right to the point. The firing or not renewing of Coach Kasparovich is absurd. I've been around this program as a player, student, and fan for over 20 years. What is happening to the storied program is disgraceful. Wall-to-wall -wall coverage on the biggest news outlets in the area for weeks now, and you from the board are hiding behind the privacy and protection shield that you've concocted. The investigation that Bowman and Salopec ran is quite telling about how thin your evidence really is. You had to call dozens and dozens of current and former players, some who have not even been in the school for years, to ask them leading questions, searching for the slightest imperfection. Your fishing expedition for evidence came up short. Hazing is a serious crime and carries consequences in Pennsylvania. Yet, the alleged evidence used to fire Coach K didn't even rise to the level of police intervention, as confirmed by the Northern Regional Police Department. Your case is thin and getting thinner by the minute. Some of you uh, administrators, I remember seeing at the Pine Richland versus North Allegheny football game at Ambridge High School in 2017. This was after the PR flag was so epically planted in the NA defeated or the defeated NA Tiger logo. You sat in utter shock and dismay watching that game. I remember pointing out to some other fans to saying that you didn't even cheer one time at that game. Why? 
because you were too busy sitting there thinking about how you were going back to North Allegheny and tell your former colleagues and neighbors how the PR football program just seems undeterred by any on or off the field noise. My take on the situation is that you have had an outfitted coach and program for years. You were wringing your hands in 2020 with the COVID-19 crisis. You thought you could catch the program stepping the slightest bit out of line and end the championship Casper era. You tried ending the season with the fans on the hill or the egregious and dangerous offenses of eating a bag of potato chips on the bus. This team followed all of your draconian rules and threats of suspension and still won a 5A state championship. This is why I believe you what drove you so far over the edge to start this fishing expedition in the first place. After all these years, at some point, you'll just need to sit back in your chair and be amazed that Coach K can deal with all the aspects of running a championship program, hold down a full-time job, have a family, and deal with your nonsense. Killing this program is a huge mistake. The coaching staff created so many opportunities for PRHS students. We have football players at some of the biggest and most prestigious universities like Boston College, Notre Dame, and Penn. Also military service schools like West Point with an acceptance rate of 12% and the U.S. Naval Academy with the acceptance rate of 8 The impact also reaches far beyond football. Revenues from this program go on to help supplement other sports, giving other students the opportunity to compete. Look around at highly successful football programs, and they often go hand-in-hand -hand with successful other sports in the district. Like it or not, the backlash from this decision is a huge ripple effect on the district. Bottom line, this was a mistake, and the community is at large has made that loud. Mr. Crawford, you have 10 seconds to wrap it up. You all have an opportunity to renounce this decision and maybe, maybe have a chance in the next election. You can go out doing the right thing and fix this, or go out with a stain on your future political endeavors. Either way, you've woken up. Mr. Stoberner. Our next caller is Aaron Orga. Ms. Williams, could you greet the callers? Please, I got a couple things going on with sure. the timers. Ms. Orga? Hello? Hi. Hi, you're with the board. Hi, my name is Aaron Orga. My son is an eighth grader at Pine Ridge Middle School. I called her tonight to talk about mistakes. I flew fighters in the Air Force for 10 years, and I have over 50 combat sorties in Iraq. And the biggest lesson that I have learned from flying fighters was how to recognize and admit a mistake, and then how to learn and correct it. Of the thousands of sorties that I have flown, not a single one has ever been perfect. And so when I was done flying, I would sit with my crewmates and we would debrief. I would set aside my ego, I would set aside my rank, and so would everyone else, because we knew that the important thing was to learn. And so we would meticulously go through every second of every flight. And when someone made a mistake, they would own it. We, as a team, would talk about why and how it happened, and they would learn from it. They would correct it, and they would not make that same mistake again the next time that they flew. To me, this is a pivotal lesson that every person should learn because we are all human. We all make mistakes. The question is whether or not we learn from them. You, the school board members and administration have made a mistake, but not hiring Coach Kasparovich back. The people of Crane Richland have risen up in the thousands to tell you, you have made a mistake. They have rallied, they have protested, they have signed petitions, sent emails, made phone calls to tell you, you have made a mistake. And so my question for you tonight is, will you own it? Will you set aside your egos and admit that you made a mistake? Because you can still learn from it. You can still correct it. You can still fix it. And so my other ask tonight is to please fix this mistake. Please hire Coach Kasparovich back. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Orga. Mr. Stobiner, our next caller is Dr. Murhut. I'm sorry I'm not here to take your call. Please leave a message and I will get back. Move on to our next caller, Mrs. Julia, Julia Taylor. Mrs.
Ms. Taylor? Hello? Hello? Ms. Taylor, you're on with the board. Thank you. I am a parent, of, excuse me, I'm a parent of two football players, a junior and a fourth grader. I am calling in today to share an important letter to address the board and administration that our 11th grade parent support written by Todd Yoakum. I wanted to make sure that you all had a chance to hear this. Over the years, I have had the opportunity to interact with many of you in a variety of settings. Sometimes we shared similar viewpoints and other times we didn't. But in all cases, I would be hard pressed to say that our encounters were not best cordial and at worst pro professional. With that being said, myself and others on the football staff have long felt that there was an us against them mentality between the football program and administration. Even after our assumption was confirmed by Mr. Simmons last fall, threatening words from administration were largely overshadowed by your actions. We were allowed to start the football season, continue to play in spite of conflict, and complete a championship season during a surge in the pandemic. Myself and everyone associated with the team is very grateful for that. However, the recent allegations, specifically those of hazing, rates of passage, and intimidation in the football program over a period of years <laughs> have shattered any remaining trust, not only between the football program and the administration, but also it seems between the district and the community at large. Although Coach K and his family have shouldered the most significant weight of these allegations, they have had a ripple effect throughout the football community. Let me be clear, not only have you sullied the reputation of Coach K by associating him with a potential felony, but you have also tied that allegation to approximately 20 coaches, 170 players, and 500 directly related family members who have coached and played during Coach K's tenure. As you have seen, the impact and blowback from these charges runs very deep in our local and statewide community. I have been very vocal, frequent, harsh critic of, both, critic of both administration's investigation as well as school board's lack of oversight and situation. As one of my colleagues said, the entire process has been a witch hunt that from the beginning was designated to take down Coach K and the program. Like the charge of hazing, alleging a witch hunt is not something to be taken lightly. But unlike Coach K's situation, there is an ample evidence to support the claim. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Taylor. Mr. Stobiner, our next caller is Mrs. Jane Goshes. Hello, Mrs. Goshes. Hello? Hello? Hi, you're on with the board. Hi, my name is Jane Gochis. I've been a member of this community for almost 25 years. I have four children, um, two of which have gone through the district, two in the district currently. One is a junior football player, and my daughter is an eighth grader. And I am actually going to just continue on reading the letter that Coach Yoakum sent to the board, um, as I feel uh, I strongly agree with all the points he made, and I, we are, I'm just going to continue on with that. There was a clear motive and means Mr. Simmons' statement that Mr. Pasquinelli hates Eric and he wants to see him fired, unambiguously supports this. Furthermore, Mr. Pasquinelli is the direct supervisor of the entire investigative staff, Mr. Salapek, Mr. Simmons, and Mr. Bowman. He did not like Coach K and was in a position to make sure the investigation turned out as he wanted it. The procedure and process by which the investigation was conducted would be at best described as sloppy and at worst biased. Here are some points regarding that. A pattern to which current and former players were selected for interview, manipulative behavior before and during the interviews by Mr. Salapak and others based on their personal relationships with students, and selective follow-up on information provided during the interviews. In summary, there seemed to be a systematic approach to coerce information from those players who were deemed most vulnerable or likely to talk, coupled with suppression of follow-up investigation into information that would corroborate 
that no hazing took place. Next point, privacy and discretion seem to be ignored throughout this process. The most glaring example of this, board member Ben Campbell resigning because he leaked confidential information about the results of the investigation. As has been reported and confirmed, the local police were not called to investigate as would seem to be required if any form of child abuse had taken place. There is an implied assumption that hazing is child abuse. And my last point from the letter hanging over all of this is the significant appearance of quid pro quo in a years long scheme to consolidate power. Consolidate that a little over, consider that a little over two years ago, Mr. Salapak was a social studies teacher at a local school district and had worked with our senior administrators there. He was hired as a third assistant principal because of a quote unquote rising enrollment, which is a false justification with respect to my understanding of the high school. Mrs. Gershis, you died. have 10 seconds. He has tapped the leadership of the lead investigator into Coach K and then 15 minutes after presenting his results was promoted to athletic director, evident, which evidently, and to my knowledge, does not require an open application process. I urge you to reinstate Coach K. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sobin, our next speaker is Cynthia Boyd. Mrs. Boyd, hello. Hello, Mrs. Boyd. Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker, Dawn McLean. <laughs> Mrs. McLean? Yes. Hi, this is you're at the board. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, yes, my name is Dawn McLean. Um, I have a son in 11th grade. Um, I wanted to continue to read the letter as well because I think it pulls out some very um, significant information. Um, so to continue with the letter, the above narrative primarily focuses on the actions of the administration. However, I also believe that the school board shares blame for the current situation. The impression in the community and to some extent confirmed by the current school board members is that the board ap approves what is presented by administration without question. For mundane tasks, that seems like a reasonable approach, but I do not believe that such leeway should be given by the board when presented with documentation that confirms the egregious behavior, such as hazing, rites of passage, and intimidation that have taken place. The public trust requires an implicit fiduciary responsibility by the board and as a whole and for each board member individually to question and confirm the facts of such allegations. There has been no confirmation either publicly or from individual members that such fact finding occurred. Rather, each member rubber stamped that was presented to them by the administration. I just wanted to summarize the school board acknowledged the investigation that led to the current football situation and tainted and or tainted and retract the letter served by Coach K served to Coach K. The Coach K and his staff be approved by the board for the 2021-22 school year. That the letter be given to Coach K and placed and be placed in his personal file detailing the circumstances surrounding this event and absolving him from the allegations described in the letter. I apologize that I am stumbling through this letter, but this is extremely difficult for us to read this. This has been very difficult on our families and our children. This man is a good person and he should not be treated this way in his family. Please consider reinstating him. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. McLean. Mr. Stobin, our next caller is John Corey.
Mr. Corey? Yes. You're on with the board. Hi, can you guys hear me? Hi, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. This is John Corey. I live at 306 North Wind Court. I've been in front of the board a bunch of times in the last four months. I started coming here talking about mental health and the challenges I saw in my, in my children staying home. Um, I stayed more involved because I didn't feel like you guys heard me at all. I'm standing outside with a whole bunch of people now who don't feel like they're being heard by you guys. The challenges I have with this investigation are, are, are many. Mr. Salopak has lied to these students and how he chose to approach all of this. None of that is okay. You fired a coach who's a member of this community, a very highly respected man that, that, that everyone out here respects. You fired him with an email. That is not okay. He has asked for a simple conversation from all of you and you simply will not get back to him. That is also not okay. You hold a press conference to talk about all this stuff in a room that I, none of us are allowed in, but the press is allowed in. I don't understand any of the choices you are making right now. You work for us. I run a business, and if I ignore my customers, I'm not going to have a business. I want every single one of you to understand that you guys work for us. And I came last meeting and asked you to please reconsider and solve this by at least having a conversation with Coach. You owe that to him. He's a member of this community. I don't think any of this is simple, guys. I don't. But there are better answers here than the road that we're on. And I'm imploring you to do a better job than we have done to this point. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Corey. Mr. Stobin, our next caller is Beth Smallwood. Ms. Smallwood? Ms. Smallwood, are you on? Okay, we'll move on to our next caller. Hello? Oh, you want to try again? We'll try Ms. Smallwood again. Ms. Smallwood, are you there? Hello? Hello, you're on with the board. Okay, hi. My name's Beth Smallwood, and I live at 4711 South Woodland Circle. As a mother of four children, one of the most important character traits my husband and I have tried to teach our kids is respect. Respect for self and respect for others. What has happened in this school district, especially in this past month, has shed much light on this very trait, but not in a good way. The things that we have all found out about our school board president in particular is riddled with disrespect and things that simply cannot be ignored. The very opposite of what I am trying so hard to instill in my kids. Disrespect of women in reference to multiple police reports, disrespect of women. This is Mr. Palmer. We've interrupted the speaker. Um, because the speaker is commenting about a matter that is personally directed and abusive and also is not relevant uh, to tonight's meeting. It relates to an alleged incident personal to a board member that is not a matter before the board this evening. Our next, our next speaker is Christine Lenz. Ms. Lenz? Hello. Yes. Hi, you're on with the Hi. board. Hi, my name is Christine Lenz. I'm the mother of three children at Pine, Ridge, Pine Richland School District, and I live at 810 Oxford Court. The PR football program under Coach Casper's leadership has been a transformative experience for my son. While football has always been a big part of our family life, Connor has learned so much from Coach Kasparovich and the entire coaching staff. Through the program, he has learned to give his best effort in everything that he does. He's become a better student. He's developed a passion to give back to the community as he has become a youth football coach for two years in a row. He has become more accountable and respectful and a better big brother. He has also become a more involved student in school as he recently joined the track and field team as a thrower. 
As you can see, it is not just about football for him. It has influenced him throughout many aspects of his life. On a different note, a large contributing part of this investigation, this three-month investigation, has been about possible hazing and ethnic intimidation in the football program. There have been a lot of references to the alleged victim's ethnicity. It is significant to report that I am of the same ethnic group as the alleged victim. My parents are first-generation Filipino immigrants. I'm a 100% Filipino American, which makes Connor 50% Filipino. I want it on the record that I have asked Connor many times about the possibility of hazing or ethnic intimidation at practices and the locker room. He has not identified any circumstances in which he felt that this has existed or occurred. For these reasons, I urge you to reinstate Coach Casper and his staff. You have been elected in these positions to represent our voices. Do your due diligence to uncover the facts surrounding the allegations of intimidation and hazing associated with this three-month investigation that has contributed to the non-renewal and dismissal of Coach K and his staff. Also, include the input of parents and families into the decision-making process of the football program, and then I urge you to reinstate Coach Casper and his staff. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stobin, our next uh, speaker is Joe Casario. <clears throat> Mr. Casario? Mr. Casario, are you there? Yes, yes. Hi, you're on with the board. Okay, thank you. First off, I'd like to say to the board, thank you so much for accomplishing one very large thing. You brought our community together. There's a carnival atmosphere out here because we're all together. We're all like-minded. We're all here in support of Coach K. He's a man that's done so much for the young men and young women in this community, from parents on down. He's done more for this community than, dare I say, the school board has done in quite a long time. So I ask myself, I've heard it was a unanimous vote to fire or not renew Coach K. This is absolutely absurd to me. Unanimous? Unanimous? When do you get a unanimous vote for anything? You board members are hiding. We know, we know you're hiding. You're hiding behind those metal curtains right now. You don't allow us to see you. You won't meet with us anywhere we can all get together. I mean, which, which was more egregious? Whatever Coach K did or what he did to your egos? Because obviously something really went wrong. Nothing in the letter that you sent to the community screams unanimous. There was nothing in there. There was nothing in there that said you should destroy this man and the coaches that he has brought along with him. You've made our community a laughing stock. So many of my friends and my colleagues say, what is going on up there? And I tell them what's going on up there is a school board out of control, a school board that can't stand to be second fiddle to a great coach and a great man. I say stop hiding. Please stop hiding. Stop hiding in your room. Stop hiding behind those curtains. Stop hiding behind the lawyers and COVID. Stop hiding behind each other. You've set a precedent. I hope you realize this. You've opened a can of worms. You've let the genie out of the bottle. You can't put it back in. When you want to ride on rumors and innuendos, there's rumors and innuendos going around our community right now. There's rumors and innuendos going around about potential members of Pine Richland upper level leadership. Are those going to get investigated? Tell me. I think we all know what rumors I'm talking about. When's it going to happen? When are we going to investigate potential things in our school community that should not be allowed to happen? Are you going to have the same criteria that you went on the witch hunt against Coach K to root out evil in our leadership to make sure that no young man or young woman is led by someone who doesn't have the moral backing to stand up and to be a person of character and content? My question to the school board is will you stand up 
Will you listen to these rumors? Will you hear the Mr. innuendos? Mr. Casario, you have 10 seconds. We need to know. You should want to know. And if you don't, I implore the media, dig, dig deep and see what the problem is with this upper level management. Thank you. Mr. Stobiner, we're going to reach back out to Dr. Murhut. He has contacted us to say he'd like to speak. I'm sorry I'm not here to take your call. Please leave a message. Was that Mrs. Boyd or Dr. Murhut? He's trying Dr. Murhut right now. Is that Mrs. Boyd or Dr. Murhut? Dr. Murhut? Hello. Hello. You're on, you're on with the board, Dr. Murhut. Thank you very much, and I, I, I apologize for the first. Um, so thank you for this opportunity to speak to the board. After reading the, uh, the letter emailed to Coach, Coach Kasparovich and the associated April 22nd, 2021 article, my only response was, really? So I'm, I'm, I'm concerned. As a former teacher, coach, high school principal, and assistant principal, I can assure you that what, what that letter alleged against Coach K and his staff, in my opinion, following a, an investigation that was a little fishy, occurs in schools, athletic teams, faculties, and administrations across the country. Would Coach K, Mrs. Bowman, or even Mr. Salopek condone this type of behavior anywhere. Of course they wouldn't. But I can assure you that bullying, hazing, intimidation occurs within the Pine Richland schools on a daily basis, not just what your investigation summarized with the football team. It happens everywhere. As a former high school principal and assistant principal, one of my biggest pet peeves was bullying and I dealt with it when I when I had students willing to tell on the persons responsible with an iron fist. It absolutely was not tolerated. And I can assure you, however, that bullying, intimidation, hazing, and rites of passage occurred regularly without my knowledge. Once again, does not make it right. And the Pine Richland, if the Pine Richland coaching, coaching staff condone this type of behavior, then I would agree with the recent move. But this clearly is not the case. I have four nephews that played under this staff, and I spoke with each one of them, and they all assured me that what your administration has alleged did not happen and would never be condoned by this coaching staff. I'm very concerned with the leadership within our school district, starting with the board president, who he himself has been a bully, according to former board members who I've spoken to. I've spoken to teachers in this system who also say the same thing about their superintendent. I completed my doctoral degree from Duquesne University in 2000. My dissertation topic was on transformational leadership and the impact this style of leadership had on national award winning school districts, high schools in 1998. Dr. Mirhat, you have 10 seconds to wind up, please. Thank you. Just last week, two petitions were filed. One looking for a vote of confidence, of, of no confidence, and the other one reinstating Coach K. 10,000 for Coach K, 900. <clears throat> Item 1.06, correspondence, Ms. Williams. Actually, if you don't mind, I'd like to say a few things. Yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I'm not sure if everyone listening knows who I am. Um, I'm Greg DiTullio. Uh, I serve the Pine Richland School District as a director. 
I've served for a little over seven years. Um, as I talk from the things I have to say, I'm going to bet that I'm going to upset everyone in this room and everyone standing outside. The reason I believe that's going to happen is because in my entire time on the board, I've never been afraid to say what I think, and what I think is what I know in my heart to be true. Most likely, the most upset person in this room with me is going to be our attorney, and that's just being honest. I'm, I'm a talker, so forgive my length. I ask you only to listen and to understand what is heard on social media is not always true. Case in point, last week a report came out about an administrator, which was untrue. It was taken as gospel by many. No one wanted this. No one in this room, no one involved with the investigation. But right now, we are teaching our kids, collectively as a community. Some of the things I'm going to talk about is civil discourse. Anyone out there can dislike anyone in here, but I will make one exception because if anyone dislikes this person, I wouldn't have a word for you. One of the most respected people for me in this room is our board secretary, Barb Williams. And when I talk about civil discourse, I want everyone to understand when you send a letter to the school board general email, the first person who gets that and sees every one of those emails is Barb Williams. I don't know if you've got a favorite aunt, if you really respect your mother, whoever that person is in your life, when you send that email, regardless of what you want to say to us, remember that that person's the first person that's going to read it. Some of the emails are so disgusting, I couldn't even read them. Please be respectful to who you're sending. If you want to send me something, send it to my email. Don't send it to the general board correspondence. Barb is way too good a person to do that. She's better than anyone in here, and I will challenge she's better than anyone out there. I'm going to talk about culture for a minute and mob rule. I think everyone knows where I lay politically, and if you don't, you obviously haven't been paying attention to what I've been saying. But when we talk about mob rule last year, everyone on my side of the aisle would have been appalled by what was happening across the cities of the U.S., with riots. But the same people who believe like I believe would also be able to turn around and look at what happened on January 6th in our, in our capital and also call it like you see it. And it was wrong. When we talk about mob rule and we talk about what's going on and we talk about one of the points, and I will say this again, one of the points of the investigation that brings up hazing and bullying. And I've heard tonight that there's absolutely no evidence of that. And that's what some people have said, the caller's calling in. Is it so hard to believe that hazing and bullying might be going on in a community or in a football program when the same people claiming nothing happened are trying to bully and harass senior administrators of this school and every school board member? I'll say it again, bully, harass, intimidate, threaten every member of this school board and every member of this senior administration. Is it such a stretch to think that the culture might have something to do with it? We are teaching our children. You can disagree with administration. I do it all the time and I make no secret about it. But everyone, and I will repeat this because I've heard people talk about this, everyone who has seen everything about the investigation 
came to the same conclusion. Changes are needed in our football program, period. There's no other way to slice it. If you want to justify it by sparsing things, if you want to justify it by saying, well, this happens everywhere, here's what I'll say to you. If you say this happens everywhere, so it's okay, I'm going to tell you if the industry standard stinks, we're not going to hold ourselves to the industry standard. We need to be better. We need to be better as a community, and that includes the football program. I don't know Eric Kasparovich personally, but I understand from everyone that I've talked to that he's a pretty good guy. And from the administration, I have never heard a disparaging word about Eric Kasparovich. I know that's been stated. I've never heard it. As a matter of fact, I've heard quite the opposite. No one was thinking, wouldn't it be a great idea, because we haven't had enough to deal with, that we decide to not renew Coach Kasparovich? No one wanted this. Mr. Kasparovich sent us a thoughtful letter to everyone in the board. Um, I'm not on social media, but I understand he may have shared that today. I have no idea. There's a lot of good ideas in that letter, many good suggestions. I think Mr. Kasparovich can help with the healing process. If simply, step one would be to ask your supporters to stop attacks, to stop bullying, to stop harassing, to stop intimidating. Somebody sends me an email that disagrees with me, disagrees with administration, I'm okay with that. But trying to get people to say there's no intimidation and there's no bullying while you're bullying and intimidating doesn't make common sense. To the anonymous individual who sent a threatening letter to my home, and I want, I want to make everyone understand this, to the anonymous individual who th sent a threatening letter to my home as well as multiple other school board members, anonymous, I find it ironic that the first word that you wrote down was courage, asking us to find courage when you don't have the courage to tell us who you are. I'm not sure that this will make a difference to whoever this individual is, but I happen to not be home when that letter was received. It was received by my wife, who opened it up not knowing what it was about, thinking it might be a bill, junk mail, things like that. My wife was at home with my disabled daughter, and you wanted to send a threatening email. I don't know if the desired effect for you happened, but I don't know what you were going for. I have no words for you. I will pray for you, but I have no words for you. On the topic of Board President Peter Lines, it is no secret that Peter and I are not political allies. We disagree on almost every political issue that I can think of. We have never until now, I don't believe, agreed on a controversial issue. We have never had a vote that's been divided where Peter and I were on the same side. I've heard people ask for Peter to resign. I've heard pe people say discouraging, or disparaging things about Peter. They've tried to bring up things from his past and say that he should resign from the board or we should force him out. Nothing, to my knowledge, about Peter Lyons says that he should be removed from office. He was duly elected multiple times in his region. And I will make it clear, and this may upset Peter, I'm not in his region, but I would oppose Peter. It's just where our political views are, and that's okay. I don't agree sometimes with how Peter gets things across to people. 
but that's not a reason to remove him. That's not a reason to ask him to step down. For people who agree with me politically, understand what you're asking is, we don't like Trump, so we're going to impeach him. I know that has to resonate with the folks who agree with me politically. But if we're going to be honest, we have to be honest the same way. I don't agree with Peter in politics, but there's no reason, to my knowledge, for which he should be removed from office for anything that people are saying. On the administration, and I don't believe anyone has said this, and I think it's because of their dignity. But I'm going to say something about one administrator, and it's Mike Pasquinelli. When I heard the charges against Mike Pasquinelli saying that he hates the coach, number one, I've heard Mike Pasquinelli say quite the opposite. But as soon as I heard it, the first thought in my head was there is no way Mike Pasquinelli would ever make that kind of comment. I don't know if he could make that kind of comment against anybody simply because of what I know about Mike Pasquinelli. And Mike and I have had our share of interesting conversations over the years. Not always agreeing, but there is no way for a second that I believe that that happened. Again, I've said that I disagree with administration more than most on this board, maybe, maybe more than everyone combined ever on this board. I will always voice opposition when it's warranted. There is no one that wanted this meeting in person more than me. That's what I would have done. I disagreed with this administration. I disagreed with the board, but we made a decision to have it here. I would not have. I would not have because of COVID restrictions. Right now, I would much rather be having a conversation about why I'm the only person in a room of 20 people, all adults, who have either been vaccinated or had an opportunity to be vaccinated, and I'm the only one not wearing a mask. That's a conversation that I would love to have. I'm just going to close by saying this, and our attorneys will love this one. I, I would like to ask Eric Kasparovich, as I said before, to publicly ask his supporters to drop the attacks. I, at least, and I would also invite the board or anyone on it, I would also like to invite the administration at the behest of the, um, uh, the attorneys. But I would love to sit down and have a conversation because I really think that air can be part of the solution. I think we are a better community than what we've seen. You think we can be better as a board and as administrators, and I certainly, from what has been said to us and said to administration, think that we can be a better community. Thank you. Dr. Mihalik? Yeah. yeah, thanks. I'd, first, I want to thank Mr. DiTullio for his comments. I really appreciate the candor and the passion and the truth. Thank you very much. For everyone tuning in tonight, we, all nine of us, want to mark as a reminder that it's the duty of the board to make decisions in the best interest of the district and a duty of the administration to ensure that the safe and effective operations of the district are fundamental. The board has and continues to take this duty seriously in alignment with the district's core values of focusing on every child every day. We've heard from many people this evening we're listening to what's being said. We feel the impact. The board, all nine of us, recognize and appreciate the interest in the football program and what a crucial experience being a part of a team is. All nine of us continue to expand opportunities for our students, both inside and outside the classroom, 
such as the construction of the ram's cage, as well as planned athletic renovations. In keeping with its duties, the board, all nine of us, are focused on looking forward and receiving updates from the administration on the search and selection process for a new head coach. The board does not anticipate any public items on our agenda for this topic until the selection process is completed with a recommended candidate from the administration. We're looking and working on ways for additional public input into the selection process and criteria. In the best interest of the district, we, all nine of us, encourage everyone to begin to look forward as well. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Correspondence, Ms. Williams. Rather than read everybody on the list here, I'd just like to encourage everybody to, that as they send in their uh, board correspondence, it will be continued to be forwarded to the board members. Thank you. Item 1.07 is a motion to approve the four meeting minutes as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 2.01 is another strategic plan update on long-term and short-term planning. I, I think it's particularly relevant uh, because with all the noise, figurative and literal, uh, we're approving a budget, uh, the proposed final general budget. I think we're going to talk about the planning that goes into that every year and gets us to this point. Um, Dr. Miller, please. Okay. Thank you. We are going to record this. Uh, we do not anticipate sending it out as a podcast, but we're going to record it this evening, and so we will uh, work through the, the slides uh, and have this as an archive. Uh, so Mrs. Hayden, just for your awareness as a new member onboarding, uh, we have, it's probably been about five years that we have a strategic update section on every board agenda. And in a typical board meeting, we provide information about one initiative or another to the board, answer any questions, just to keep everybody updated. Every quarter, we provide a, an update of all key initiatives and a dashboard of strategic direction. Tonight, we have a different approach. So tonight, in order to sort of assist with that onboarding process, we're going to provide a quick update of the last five to eight years. So you can see the context of the district, strategic direction, and organizational change as it has occurred. We talk often about our mission, vision, values because they're important to us. They were developed and determined two cycles ago in strategic planning, and they have been refined in each cycle ever since. They're deeply embedded to how we think, how we talk, and how we operate. So you've heard that already this evening to focus on learning for every student every day. And we say it's the word every that makes that incredibly challenging. 4,600 students with a diverse set of needs, it's in incredibly challenging to meet individual needs. And so it is that word every, every student every day that makes that so compelling. The image on this slide was designed by a student. So we had a student at the high school uh, who in a graphic arts course was able to take some of the complexity of our mission, vision, and values and put it into this Rube Goldberg-esque uh, picture. And this has been refined. It started with a blackboard, believe it or not, and that shifted to a whiteboard interactive display board. But the idea of the vision starts with the student, every, in the bottom left-hand corner, and it flows like an S pattern through the image until it ends up as a paper airplane going out the window. And you see the light bulb on the paper airplane. It sort of connects the student with when, we, when children leave Pine Richland, the imagery here, you see the paint can, it's our goal for them to make their mark on the world, whatever that mark is. And through their experience in all of our programs, we've defined learning in very specific ways. So if you look at the steam rising from the beakers, you see learning is different for different people. And that means our teachers, our coaches, our sponsors need to vary their approach to help students be successful. You see inside and outside of the classroom. We talk about this all the time. Powerful learning on the field, on the stage, 
in the marching band, in a forensics tournament, in all of those places. Learning is just not within the four walls of the building. And during COVID, we've seen that more than anything else as we've had altered models. Achievement and growth is a critical part of this. It means that it's not just about what a student knows on a given day, but it's also the growth that they've been able to demonstrate over a period of time. And we heard Ms. Gearin talk about that earlier in Transforming the Future. How are we evaluating growth for students in a full virtual model? Effort and persistence, meaningful learning is hard work. It requires a stick to that's captured there. And as we've heard a lot from different speakers tonight, it requires all of us, students, parents, staff, community. Pursuing excellence as a school district is a challenge. This busy image captures that challenge in a very intentional way. And the fact that it was developed by a student to capture what it is we believe about learning, I think is one of the coolest things um, out there. And as you look at that image, we worked really hard to try to reflect all of the different parts and pieces of what happens in schools somehow to uh, the images that are there. So if you see in the title, we say compass, the mission vision values is the compass, the strategic plan that was developed with 400 members of our community is the map. So I'm gonna pick it up from there and, and talk a little bit about the strategic planning process. Uh, it's tough to read the text on the image on the left, but the concept is about collaboration. It's about gathering input, like Dr. Miller said, from a large number of people. What we typically do as administration, we obviously we come in with ideas, and those ideas are generated from talking with our staff and our students, and then we listen to community and gather input, and then we make adjust, adjustments based upon, upon that input. That happened in our first strategic planning process for the first four years, and it's happening now we're in um, the second set of four years. Uh, on the right-hand side, you see the image of the books. Those are our categories within our strategic plan. You know, I've worked myself in a number of school districts, and there are strategic plans that sit on a shelf that are there kind of, you know, we have to do it as part of a requirement. Uh, I can say that in this district, it is the map. I mean, we live it. We talk about it all the time. We set ourselves in terms of expectations. We hold ourselves accountable. We expect our board and a community to hold us accountable to those expectations as well. It is what drives us. The top two books, of course, are the most important. They are around what kids do. They're learning, they're engaging, uh, most important things. So those categories have remained the same over the, the two different strategic plans. There have been some modifications to the categories of the bottom three, but those bottom three are the foundation. If you've got the finance and operations, if you've got a pursuit of excellence, it's obviously going to impact the top two, which are going to impact the experience for kids. Um, so the next slide, if we go to, I'll, I'll look, we'll look a little bit of, of how we, um, I think there's one, there it is. This is a nice diagram to see how we map the process out. You know, how do we get from the idea to action? And this is a big part of implementation and change because parents and kids, they want to, they want to see and experience that change that we're talking about. So the example here, um, there's long-term goals that span over four years. And then each year in collaboration with staff and students and administration and parents, we talk about what are the short-term goals to get to that long-term goal over that span of four years. There at times are modifications on an annual basis based upon progress and things that pop up. Again, never expecting COVID, all, this, all of a sudden that becomes something that we have to work through and we implement that in through our strategic plan. So the part that I just want to make sure we all see and hit on it is the bottom. And that's, that's the accountability piece, you know, literally posting to our website of progress we're making or not as much as we'd like on each of those individual action steps under each of those um, specific goals. So a community member can go on our website at your service, click on strategic plan, and see how we're doing. Are we making adequate progress? Or we need to you know, make some adjustments? Or are we behind with some of the progress that we'd like, we'd like to make? Um, and at the end of every year, there are, these are results-driven action plans. So we're looking for measurable goals that we can say we're making the impact for students that we want to make. So it's, it, is, it, is, it is the map of what we're doing here at the district. Um, and it is something that is constantly 
being discussed, again, not just at a, at a small senior leadership level, but across the organization. And it is through the leadership and the governance system working together that we're able to enact what that map says, right? So we've been working over the years to have cascading retreats, uh, whether it begins with the board and looking back at the strategic plan that we've developed and then moving into the senior leaders, into the principals, and even our academic leadership council members. We're taking that system of leadership and fully amplifying our efforts by making sure that our systems are aligned. We're developing our people to continue to build more leaders and that we are setting the direction very clearly around everything that is the mission, vision, values. So we have multiple examples of how this works. I will hit on a few um, and a couple slides as well, but we have a healthcare leadership council that is alive and well right now um, in the midst of the pandemic. And um, Mrs. Miss Mack, I'll say thank you. Uh, she is a board member who is assisting us with that process. So we have multiple opportunities, even throughout the leadership councils where different board members will wear a hat um, and we'll cover a few of those in a, a few slides as well, where there are multiple responsibilities and occasionally they're connected to the committees that the um, board members serve on, et cetera. So, um, that is something that you'll see. But in addition to that, you'll see the staff, students, parents, and community off to the side. Again, Healthcare Leadership Council, we reference the medical experts from the community who are helping us provide that lens. We're asking the students themselves how things are going um, and getting input and feedback from them to make decisions. So we see this system um, as a new image that we've created to capture the process we utilize repeatedly in order to inform us on a number of topics. So Ms. Hathorne is going to speak to the communication system, and we'll come back to this concept in another moment. Uh, thank you. Uh, we constantly review and refine a range of systematic and varied methods of communication that we deploy at Pine Richland to engage all of our stakeholders. And that aligns to our strategic plan, mission, vision, and values, as you heard uh, Dr. Pasquinelli and Dr. Miller refer to. And four years ago, within our strategic plan, communication was its own category when you saw the stack of books. Well, communication is not in that uh, list of books, it is uh, still important. It's not in the latest iteration of the strategic plan categories, but it is important. But we also integrate embedded in all of our initiatives in everything we do. And um, this image you see on the screen uh, captures only a portion of our communication matrix within our organization. We knew we were doing a lot of good things, but how systematic were we? So over the past several years, we developed this matrix to really study our methods of communication. And you can see, if you look, it might be too small, but uh, you can look at uh, really our method, website, print, electronic notification, surveys, et cetera, author and audience, showing which stakeholder groups we wish to communicate with, whether it be students, parents, or workforce, community, and key partners. Uh, so one, one other area we addressed was one-way communication, which is typically mass communication and also two-way communication, which is more interpersonal. For instance, we use the rapid call as a one-way communication tool for emergencies only. And I also want to point out before I go on, the Pine Richland School Board also created a communication matrix that is very similar to the district matrix under the direction of Mr. Lyons and Mrs. Misbach with the help of Board Secretary Barb Williams for a strong systematic approach as well to communication from the board. Through the revision process though, we refined the timing and type of messages for maximum readership and viewership of the district messages. What we did discover is we, uh, when we looked at a close look at our communication system, we realized we really needed to increase our two-way communication uh, to our stakeholders. And uh, the frequency and type of face-to-face -face informational sessions were increased as a result. Uh, so we've been holding more town halls. And well, with COVID, it's virtual, but you know, more face-to-face -face meetings. And as a cycle of learning, we also uh, made improvements to our key messaging. And sort of as uh, Dr. Justice alluded, we started cascading our messages from various senior leadership team members and principals, as well as increasing social media uh, communication. And we even created a spotlight on learning segment with photos, stories, and videos on our website uh, that are directly tied back to the strategic plan, mission, vision, and values, and initiatives by integrating you know, the key concepts to deeply embed them so they're understood and part of our culture. 
most recently we refined our method of communication by introducing voice over podcasts and why this was important it provides a consistent message in critical areas such as redistricting uh also um you know our pandemic messaging and since our communication system is ingrained in agile our response to COVID 19 was conduct conducted in the same strategic systematic way as we communicate everything so also finally getting close to wrapping it up for each e-blast we do gauge open rates and click rates and we also look at website views in respect to open rates this is the percentage of our recipients that are actually opening our emails and we do compare it to education industry standards in our own standards so that we can understand who if we are getting enough of our parents reviewing the messages and when we have a low open rate we know we need to either improve how we communicate or do we simply need to remessage so finally a uh, uh, stakeholder survey approach is also administered annually to our stakeholders and also our partner suppliers and the district reviews performance data from these surveys to support our decision making and uh, so we survey regarding communi critical community topics as well when they become relevant like COVID and strategic planning and also technology and most recently we've been trying to incorporate new questions about diversity equity and inclusion surveys are also being developed for end of course feedback and so forth so that's serving is just a portion of how we dig in and get feedback from our stakeholders we embed the process in our in-depth program review process and also resource and textbook review now dr justice would like to share a little more stu about student feedback and engagement undoubtedly one of our favorite ways to collect feedback is to actually go out and meet with the kids in the building so our third sixth eighth and twelfth graders um, are a wealth of information and they're living uh, the experiences directly so we go out and have um, superintendent uh, principal student leadership councils at those grade levels and we have representatives from across uh, the building we make sure that um, we have a wide range of students and in, in terms of their involvement and in programming so that we get ample feedback in the right areas and um, we've been asking them things even from the continuity of learning when we began our transitions last year um, with covid um, to understand the educational experience and to improve the opportunities that they had within the classroom to things like helping develop the portrait of a graduate which is um, sitting behind us here in the room um, coming up with the categories there it was really looking at the key themes that came from the students around areas that they knew they needed to have mastered as an adult so um, thinking about the input that they've given and what that shaped into for the district has been extremely valuable um, the in-depth program reviews which we mentioned uh, we're going to talk about that um, as well on the next slide in terms of how we are gathering input and shaping our learning and academic system that we have in place so if we want to uh, move to the next slide um, so the academic system we first started looking at it as just such we've widened it um, to be the learning system because parts of that are also behavior etc uh, which we'll hear about when we get into the tiered systems but really it begins with the model for teaching and learning and understanding that that's um, composed of both the curriculum and then the instruction and assessment that come uh, there from and our teachers have been critical they had to capture first the written curriculum um, initially um, there had not been a, a baseline really collected that was written and so in 2014-15 the teachers sat down and captured that and then also did a review of what they saw as needs and strengths uh, within each of those departments that's a document that we now refer back to as we're going through cycles of an in-depth program review process where we take a look at each department or program and understand the elements of it from curriculum instruction assessment to the actual course catalog that's offered with it the resources that come along it's really the entire umbrella um, of all of the programming that we have in place and what's really great about the in-depth program review process is it was designed here internally um, it's something that we have uh, lovingly referred to as a sled riding kind of process where initially you know it was being built as we were um, utilizing it and every time we um, implement it each year it gets a little bit better so it's it uh, in and of itself drives change and cycles of learning and improvement but it also represents exactly that in the process itself uh, which we have embedded over time so we now have nine departments that have actually gone through this um, with the cycles continuing in the future so this is not something that once you go through it you're done we're going to continue to look back at our programs and understand what it is that we can improve about them and there's both an internal and external element to that with four committees that work um, in an inter 
interconnected manner. Um, it's extremely um, data-driven, research-based. We get to connect with the community and other exemplars to really inform our process. So that is something that we're extremely proud of. Um, and then through that process, oftentimes the resources that we have um, in place are called out as something we need to take a look at. We develop rubrics. Um, and then again, that goes back to involving the stakeholders and getting input um, as to what we should be looking for within those and then evaluating them, of course, with public input as well. Uh, Mr. Hustwit um, and Dr. Paxson and Mrs. Bianco are a team here that are going to speak to the multi-tiered systems of support within that learning system. B before they do that, I just wanted to hop back for a second. So again, one of the questions, Mrs. Hayden, is people maybe don't understand or see how the board is engaged outside of a, a regular planning or voting meeting. And if you look at the leadership councils, so technology leadership council, we've had two board members engaged in that those quarterly meetings that happen. They actively participate, they serve as a voice for the board and they bring that back. We have, uh, we have a board member on Healthcare Leadership Council. We have four board members on Diversity, Equity, Inclusion Leadership Council. We have three board members who serve on Transforming the Future Leadership Council. So there's a ton of ways uh, in addition to sort of weekly updates and reading and, and becoming familiar with what's going on that board members are actively engaging in the, the strategic work of the district. So it just naturally happens. It's the extra commitment of time and involvement that I think is not always seen or understood, but it's a part of what's been happening here for a number of years. Okay. All right, so I get the privilege to speak with you tonight about something that I'm extremely proud of here at um, Pine Richland. So supports of all tiers in reading, math, and behavioral intervention and enrichment have been well established through our multi-tiered systems of support. These supports are aligned across all three of our primaries, and then they flow relatively seam seamlessly into Eden Hall. We think of that as like a unified system. We have audited our interventions through in-depth program reviews, as you heard Dr. Justice just speak about to ensure that we are targeting areas of student deficit. We are also routinely looking at the body of research to support these interventions to ensure that the research does in fact support growth for students in these targeted areas. We have invested in development of our staff, both of teachers and of paraprofessionals, uh, using routinely and systematic trainings to deliver these interventions. We also developed a decision tree um, and it is routinely updated, so it's not something that we developed five or six years ago, and then we kind of left it sitting on a shelf. But we are continually looking at it, updating the numbers, um, and aligning it to the research, and just making sure that it's relevant and usable for our staff. We use this as a go-to for decision-making. The decision tree contains cut points from our universal and secondary screeners to, to proactively address areas of weakness and reduce the wait time for intervening or providing areas of enrichment for our students. It is prescriptive in nature, meaning if the universal or secondary screening shows a deficit in, say, fluency or comprehension, the decision tree has recommendations for the most appropriate intervention for the MTSS team to consider. Interventions are also continually progress monitored. We want to make sure that our students are growing and they can move up and down tiers. So something that I always say is that our, our students aren't stuck in a tier if a student qualifies for um, in, they're in need of tier two intervention, they're not stuck in tier two. They can move up should they demonstrate growth or they may need to intensify should they not be making the progress that we hope to see. And if that progress isn't being shown, teachers also have the ability to refer to um, our MTSS team, which meets internally to discuss maybe some additional measures that may be necessary, some additional screeners, um, and make some suggestions and recommendations that can be provided in the classroom to support students. That is a working, collaborative, problem-solving team that I'm proud to be a part of. As shared, the MTSS system is not only for students in need of intervention, but also those identified as gifted or in need of enrichment. Following a similar model as I outlined above, uh, the universal screening data is used to make recommendations based on those laid out in the decision tree. So the decision tree isn't just for the intervention side, but it also is for our gifted and enrichment side. A teacher can make referrals to the MTSS team here as well if they need some suggestions on how to provide enrichment opportunities or if they think that we need to do some additional measures because their student needs to be stretched at that RAM time that we have um, across our K-6. We have refined our process district-wide to ensure that we are consistent and aligned from K to 12. We are working to expand areas of MTSS already in place at the secondary to further target the needs of students at this level. 
We also have an internal district level MTSS team, kind of like an, our internal audit team that meets regularly to look at the systems and process in place. We're continually to, striving for growth of our processes in MTSS. Before you go, I want to mention it on there. Who was at the, this is pre-COVID, the Eden Hall. We, we saw a few buildings, but specifically the Eden there. Hall. <laughs> yes, yes. I, know, I know. But I want to talk about, we don't just sit in this room and get updates on this. Um, and who, who remembers that, that meeting in Eden Hall, right? Um, Matt, we talked about this, saw it, how it works, met with the practitioners who are implementing it. Um, so even our board visits, this reflection, it's becoming more and more, that was one of our best, but there's more to come, right? So what we've done is intentionally align the building visits with this is where we are in the strategic plan. Let's pull this out. Let, let's get in there and we'll see it in action. Um, so it's just tremendous. And I, I do still remember that meeting in particular because it really made, uh, for those of you at home, I, it, you know, even after years, some of that feels unreal or too abstract. Uh, but we were taken through examples, uh, some just to guide us, and not necessarily with real data, to understand how decisions are made based on the data. So uh, that was uh, truly great. Yeah. So thank you. And this is awesome. Uh, you're getting, I think you already have a half hour professional credit toward your board training uh, <laughs> so far. So, Amy. <laughs> So before, before I start, I'd just like to give some added uh, emphasis to that decision tree, which is a really incredible document that you're probably not going to find in any other district. And it's a, it's a prescri prescriptive document, which Mrs. Bianco mentioned. And you also have to give her credit for keeping it a living document. It, it changes, it evolves every year, and um, she and, uh, and her team are a big part of that. So once we get to Tier 3, Though that's, that's when the question comes of when, when do we start the evaluation process for students who require either special education supports and services or, or gifted supports and services. And uh, once we, we, we engage in that process and, and, and make that identification, the question then becomes where and how do we provide that service? And that is the continuum of services. The continuum of services for 80% of our students begins and ends in the regular education environment. We provide our differentiation within that setting we provide remediation, we can provide enrichment and extension all within that setting uh, for most of our students. However, some students need some more intensity and then that's when we move to providing some supports and services in a pullout setting, either learning support classroom, uh, a gifted education setting for part of the school day and then there are, are students who require even more intensity than that where the, the pullout service in let's say an autistic support classroom or emotional support classroom occurs for the majority of the school day. If that does not prove intensive enough, then we're making recommendations to approve private schools. That is fewer than 5% of our students that require that level of support uh, outside of our district. 95% of our students receive their education within our walls. The most intensive spot on the continuum of services would be instruction in the home for our students who are so academically, or I'm sorry, um, medically fragile or social and emotionally fragile that they require uh, a teacher to come to their house, either in person or this year, uh, we've done a lot of virtual in instruction in the home when, when that's needed. So within that continuum of services, <clears throat> excuse me, over the past eight years or so, we've made a number of enhancements. And some of those enhancements include, as Mrs. Bianco talked about, our tier two and three supports. We've done a lot of training um, and implementation of research-based interventions uh, that did not exist here uh, over eight years ago. Um, additionally, we have provided training and model implementation of uh, co-teaching supports and services, which takes advantage of the expertise of both special education teachers and regular education teachers within the uh, regular education environment. And that is something that has implemented grades K to 12. We've also added learning specialty classrooms or hubs as, as we like to call it. Um, at Richland Elementary School we added um, two autistic support classrooms which are available to all of our students grades K to 3 to move into that uh, environment at Richland if they need that level of intensity. Um, because our other grade bands are only one building we don't need the hub idea but we do provide that level of support in, in, in each one of those buildings. Um, 
So additionally, we've enhanced our DART transition process, which is, is key to the start of a, a child's educational career. Being ready for students to come here, bef to receive students to come here before they come here is uh, really helpful in being able to hit the ground running when, uh, when, when, before they get to us. Um, Rams Way, which uh, Dr. Paxton will talk a little bit about in a minute, has also uh, been enhanced over the years and specifically uh, changed and developed based on students' developmental level at the K to three, four to six, uh, and secondary levels. Um, we've also enhanced our peer buddies program, best buddies program at the high school, which pairs um, typically developing students with students with special needs, and we find that they both benefit from that, from that process. Um, and then lastly, uh, we've also enhanced over the years our transition process from, like I started with our DART process, and then grades three to four, six to seven, and then eight to nine as well. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is that um, every district in the state of Pennsylvania is required to undergo cyclical monitoring from the State Department of Education every six years. Since I've been with the district, we've undergone it twice. And within that um, monitoring, there's what's called a facilitated self-assessment. There are 23 topic areas which the state comes in and they evaluate how we're doing. And both of those um, monitorings found us 100, within 100% 100 compliance with all 23 of those. Um, this is the third district that I've worked in, and those are the only two monitorings that I've been through where we were able to be found with 100% compliance. So that tells you a little bit about the way that we uh, are able to function within a, a compliant educational system. We do have some more um, intensive supports and services that we provide for our students that have social emotional needs. And we also happen to have maybe the most passionate person that I know when it comes to social and emotional development, and that's Dr. Maura Paxson, and I'm going to turn it over to her for that. Awesome. Thanks, Noel. Um, so something to share with you, we've increased the number of our counselors as well as psychologists. So looked at our organization structure over the past five years, and looking at, we have school counselors in each of our school buildings. So we, at the elementary level, there's a counselor at Eden Hall. We have three counselors for the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. Um, we have two counselors at our middle school, five at the high school, as well as our school social worker, Carolyn Welshans. And a big shout out for such a great job that they're doing in order to support our students. In addition to that, over the last five years, we also added a psychologist. So we have Dr. Kimmel, K through six, and then we have Dr. Ramirez, who is seven through 12, which who do an awesome job in supporting our students. So looking at that organizational structure, we also added um, Dr. Justice, our assistant superintendent, who is our K through six assistant super. So that's changed over the five to six year time range. Um, resiliency is something we believe in as a district. We really support our students and, and bouncing back during those difficult times. We really wanna empower them. And really this year has been a challenging year overall, looking at highs and lows throughout the school year and how do we support them? How do we provide them those services? We have our suicide prevention that goes on across the school, which really from K through three, we're teaching social and emotional learning. At four, five, six, we also teach that social emotional learning, but really focus on who are those trusted adults? Who can you go to during those difficult times? Again, that from a developmental model, we look at that from a middle school level of how we provide those supports, that emotional learning, how to go to somebody when they're having a difficult time into high school as well. So we're really going into the classrooms and really supporting our students, but also teaching some of that suicide prevention, but teaching our students to go to that trusted adult, as well as developing some healthy coping, uh, healthy coping skills when times are difficult. One of the things, and I, I love how Heather as well as Noel talked about that MTSS model, because what we really, when you think of the MTSS model, think of it as a multifaceted, multi-dimensional model to help support our students. So that triangle that keeps turning, right? How do we support our students from a learning perspective, but how do we support our students from um, also a social, emotional, and behavioral perspective? And really giving those levels of supports so really looking at all students, how do we build resiliency to empower growth? How do we support their behavioral needs? But really giving, that, giving them that positive reinforcement. So we talk about RAM's way, being respectful, accountable, motivated, and safe, and really supporting all students through teaching, being respectful. How do we be accountable as well as motivated and safe 
right within the classroom setting and providing our students that really that positive reinforcement. We always say teach, model, practice, reinforce. We as adults need to really teach those skills and model them to encourage our, our students to really also understand them, practice and reinforce those behaviors as well. And giving them those positive reinforcements for the behaviors of being respectful, accountable, motivated and safe. So really proud of it. I love hearing Paula talk about how it's being implemented within the virtual school, because not only have we as a district been able to maintain it face to face, we've also been able to maintain it across the district, even in that virtual setting, as we went hybrid as well as virtual. So it's been really a shout out to our teachers for doing such an out outstanding job with that. Our student assistance program is great it really looks at any barriers to students learning and we really have this model of building supports for our kids k through 12. so on the teams we have our counselors we have our teachers we have our principals and we are supporting our students from not only an academic standpoint behavioral but also mental health and how we can provide layers of supports for our kids and again that model is k through 12 so we look at barriers of learning and when you think about supports for students, it's a continuum. So some kids might need a check-in with a teacher or others might need a mental health screening to provide this, the student with additional supports. Um, it might be outside counseling, it might be an intensive outpatient partial, or it could even be a hospitalization. But again, through our student assistance program, we really provide those layers of supports to help our students when times are difficult. We have great partnerships throughout the district. Um, our partnership with Holy Family provides school-based mental health services in all of our schools, in our elementary building, Eden Hall, middle school, and the high school. So we provide those mental health supports to our children. And that's seeking a counselor right within the school setting. And any barriers to seeing the counselor or their services are offered to our families and students within the school setting. So again, it's confidential unless parents want to release that information. Um, we also have a relationship with the Caring Place, which is right within our community. They're absolutely outstanding. They provide some supports right within our school and outside of the school of brief supports for our students as well as our families. And then in addition to that, something that is um, presented this evening is Crisis Center North. It's in another partnership that we would like to have across the district K through 12. And really those would be services offered to our families right within the school day and within our schools. And so that's something that we're looking for if they're dealing with trauma, crisis, violence, those would be additional supports provided to them. So we're really excited and proud of all these great supports and a lot of shout out to all the people providing those supports to our students. Now I'm going to turn it over to Michelle Schombachler, who's outstanding mm -hmm. and has helped to lead the health and leadership within the district. And that is absolutely accurate. She is wearing her mom hat as well today, and she had an hour and a half to give us, and her son's graduation was today. So I am oh. taking her slides. So I am the liaison Bef to Before you do that, just one yeah. second. So absolutely. Dr. Paxson is the lead psychologist. She oversees K through 12. So she touches every aspect of pupil and psychological services, works hand in hand with Mr. Huswood, our director of special ed and student services. I mean, they're just, um, she, she literally has her fingers on the pulse of the entire district. She's a remarkable woman. Go ahead, sorry. <laughs> That's okay, no, absolutely. Kudos to Dr. Paxan for sure. <laughs> Um, so in terms of health services, um, it extends, you know, beyond what we were just talking about in psychological services and into like the full spectrum of what we do for kids. And so um, Michelle Schombuckler, who was going to speak this evening, is our Academic Leadership Council member for the Health Services Department. So all of our nurses. We have six certified school nurses, one LPN and one daily sub nurse. That's actually something that has been a new iteration within the last few years. Um, we find the need with um, various meetings, our need to cover the parochial schools. We have two parochial schools within our footprint that we are responsible for providing nursing services um, to their students. So um, as we have the nurses out covering each of these different roles, we have a daily nurse sub who is able to go um, and assist in wherever those vacancies may be. 
the beautiful um, image that you see on this slide is actually a newsletter that is authored monthly by our health and physical education teachers. It connects everything around wellness. And if you have a chance at some point to read the in-depth program reviews, the vision um, picture that you'll see in the philosophy statement that go along with it, talk about balancing um, mind and body. And so that's where they got the name um, in terms of this newsletter. And it really goes into things that we can do to take care of ourselves from a wellness standpoint, whether it be um, actually uh, mental um, assistance and so forth so like brain breaks that we're trying to build in um, to the school day for students how we've seen that even throughout this um, COVID time period where we were online so much being beneficial to exercising nutrition and then they've even done wellness warriors where they um, emphasize different aspects of people on the staff um, who have been a wellness warrior in terms of bringing that the aspects positive that we can talk about in our curriculum to the students so um, that's something we wanted to mention. In addition, there's another opportunity. So Mr. Lyons sits on our food service and wellness um, advisory committee. So there are, uh, in the, again, a number of committees and ways for board uh, member involvement in our district where we're looking at things. Um, Mrs. Kirk and I, along with Mrs. Bucknum, who was our food services director, um, help with um, the leadership of that group where we're looking at policy. Uh, we most recently um, provided suggestions um, for our wellness policy for the entire district, which then the board was able to review um, in a part of the normal cycle for reading. So there are lots of different touch points um, with that regard as well. I do wanna mention that within the school nurses, um, this year, particularly with the pandemic, we've learned a lot. Um, we have gone through many process revisions we've developed templates for things that never before existed um changed them multiple times so whether it was contacts to allegheny county health department notifications to families um, it's a well-oiled machine we now know how to contact trace um, and provide you know all of that information very solidly it happens um, literally in a matter of minutes to an hour or so um, each time we get a case and we have those communications off and running so it really includes a lot of things when we think about student wellness um, but we want to celebrate each of those aspects and how they're interrelated and in the future uh, we've even thought about our in-depth program review cycle including um, health services school counseling family consumer science um, and health and pe in terms of a wellness suite where we're going to have integrated recommendations forthcoming so as we begin to go through these processes, you can see these are examples of the maturity that um, begins to build over time. We're gonna transition into our human resources and work development. Thank you, Dr. Justice. So, um, just saying, I can imagine there's so much content on all these slides and all of us are like talking pretty quickly through them. Less feedback here. Um, I'm gonna try to keep that pace and that's gonna be a challenge for me because as evidenced by just the, the first bullet alone, um, I had an opportunity to speak about the maturation of the staffing process at our staff services committee meeting um, chaired by Dr. Mihalik just a month ago. Could literally spend 30 minutes just talking about that one piece. Um, but for today, let me suffice to say, um, like Dr. Justice just shared in terms of outreach to the Allegheny County Health Department, uh, it's a well-oiled machine. And so uh, the gist of it, it's basically answering two key questions any given year. And those questions are, um, related to workforce capacity. So how many of each type of position do we need in order to pursue our mission? Um, and workforce capability, which is for each of those positions, what does somebody need in terms of knowledge, skills, and abilities um, to be successful in those roles? Um, so two simple questions, very complicated process. It's like seven to eight months of deep dive, detail orientation, um, and fast pace to answer those. But to the, to the point that Dr. Justice said about a well-oiled machine, we did it last month and we were done by lunch. And so that's a credit to, uh, you know, an example of our commitment to continuous improvement and a credit to um, the way by which we sort of assess and reassess and refine processes. Um, once we've identified what it takes to be successful, we, we have developed um, standardized recruitment and hiring procedures, not across the organization, but per role group. And so, um, essentially, once we know what we're looking for, we already have a bag of tricks in which we're going to seek out those people. And, and so that's helpful for two reasons. Um, one is just in the space of mitigating uh, potential discrimination in hiring practices, right? It mitigates for that. It's a consistent practice um, or process and practice for all candidates. Um, it also improves the candidate experience. People who are coming through an interview process for Pine Ridge and School District um, won't feel like we're making up, you know, flying the plane, making up hoops for them to jump through across the way because we haven't. We've mapped that up and we, we assess and, and we refine them as, as necessary. Um, in the space of 
um, onboarding, uh, and, and specifically I'll, I'll use the term PR Academy. So in the strategic plan, um, we have both um, refined a PR Academy for, for teachers, um, and that's a Pennsylvania Department of Education requirement requires all school districts to offer new teacher induction for teachers. Um, in Pine Richland, that's absolutely our floor, not our ceiling. So we, um, while the state requires that for teaching positions, um, as well as some administrators, we have PR Academy, which is a way to um, orient uh, employee groups all across. So we have uh, secretaries, custodians. Those are not at all any way required by anybody other than our recognition that all employees are contributing to our district mission, vision, values, um, and, and a desire to set them all up for success. Um, we've talked a lot about our mission and, and the focus for learning um, for every student every day. Obviously makes sense we're a K-12 public education system and who's student-centered, um, but I think it's also important to notice that we also focus on adult learning um, significantly in this district, and that takes the form of professional development. And so a big part of our commitment to continuous improvement is our investment in professional development. Um, we utilize a Kirkpatrick model in design, and so um, that was a new model to me. At, at, in short, what it talks about is this emphasis and in, in our individuals who prepare and facilitate professional development have been trained on this model where we're not, long, we're not just focused on the learning in terms of what people know either during the session or before and after, um, but also what they do with what they know, right? So applying the knowledge, how does that change employee behaviors and ultimately impact outcomes? Uh, and so with all of our professional development, that's a focus. It's not just, you know, just content, content, content. It's the idea of applying and then assessing whether or not the learning actually changed behaviors um, and improved outcomes. Generally speaking, each employee group has dedicated in-service days. It varies based on, on role groups um, any given year, but they are structured in which are, are structured, scheduled in-service days generally aligned to key strategic initiatives. Um, and then they're threaded throughout the year. So it's never really a one and done uh, for the majority of content that, that individuals learn through professional development. Um, it's threaded, revisited, and, and grown upon in a way more authentic manner. Um, an example too, you know, a lot of this is, you know, you can see on the pictures we have um, professional development flexible in the space of in-person versus virtual, right? Uh, we also have uh, built and, and really a kudos to our um, building level technology coaches in the beginning of this year, and I know it was um, cited earlier, in our continuity of learning PD website uh, where, where teachers, like peer to peer, so teachers are sharing best practices. That specific example was um, linked primarily to technology, but not just in using the systems like Google, I and mean, it includes that, how to use a Google Meet, how to do um, some of our other software protocols, Kami, new things. Every time we adopt something new, there's people getting access to on-demand um, self-service trainings to, to familiarize themselves with it. Uh, but again, not just the technology, but also um, the best practices around it, right? So um, to really wrap our hands around it. Um, similar, also in the space of professional development are, are um, IPDPs is the acronym. And so that's Individual Professional Development Plans. Um, similar to what I said about PR Academy, we have um, roughly 520 employees in our district. Over 500 of them, you know, a couple months ago submitted an individual professional development plan. Um, and what that is, it does two key things. It is, um, at an individual level, the opportunity to identify areas of focus for continuous improvement, right? So that ties into professional growth. Um, it also helps link each individual, right? 500 something people, all of us have these, um, in terms of how their own responsibilities and areas of focus connect to the organization at large. Um, before before we go to the next slide or the so if you can picture those books i mean so we're giving you what's been happening at pine richland over the last five to eight years in however long it's taking to walk through some of those but if you can picture those books that dr pasquinelli talked about teaching and learning student progress and engagement those are the first two that's where the bulk of the time was spent mr glickman just talked about the third book workforce engagement and development we're heading now into the fourth book, which is finance and operations, right? Critical for sustainability in schools. And so I believe that's next. 
And again, we could spend eight hours just on this slide uh, talking about where were we a number of years ago with technology, infrastructure, and integration, and where are we today? So, Mr. Stobener. Hi, I'm Sean Stobener, Director of Technology for the District. I joined the team in 2015. Uh, when I was updating this slide, uh, I was filled with a great sense of pride about uh, what we've accomplished in the last few years and where we're going with technology. Uh, the photo in the upper right is a Wexford Elementary classroom pre-COVID, uh, actually the first day of school last year. A family relocated to the district a few days before the start of school, and we were able to provide the student with technology that acted as a communication bridge while the child was learning English as a second language. This simply would not have been possible before 2015. Actually, the technology audit, the external technology audit that was done in 2014 showed that most staff didn't, tr <clears throat> didn't trust technology. And many of them have learned because it has failed them in the past that they just stopped using it in their lesson planning. So this model was totally revamped beginning in 2014. And I'm not gonna talk about each bullet point here, but this is a list of some of the district's accomplishments over the last few years. At the heart of our positive shift in technology is people, starting with our building technology coaches that were previously mentioned. Uh, they were reintroduced in 2014 and the Technology Leadership Council was rebuilt, or was built. Um, the Technology Leadership Council meets four times a year uh, to review and discuss the direction of technology throughout the district. Uh, this group consists of the technology coaches, teachers, paras, where there's board representation, um, uh, Mr. Moy, um, is a member of this and um, this group uh, has supported our moving away from the fully outsourced model and it has totally changed the confidence in what's possible with technology at Pine Richland. We have a great technology team and I can't say that enough. Uh, our the average tenure of our technology team members is four years which is an eternity in the staffing field. But each item listed here and and many more can be linked through a thoughtful decision process and eventual recommendation uh, for approval to the board. These processes are modeled after the in-depth program review and the academic leadership council. I was so happy to inherit a well-defined thought out process for making technology decisions. We just tweaked it slightly and we've used this model for many major projects. You could literally map out the technology process progress that we've had through the operational services meetings and the board updates and everything that has been posted on board docs and YouTube. Uh, the technology department suffers from data overload. We have two annual surveys uh, and we, we do things like tracking system uptime. We have a thousand data points over tw every 20 seconds that are updated on systems, servers, and metrics. We utilize the Brightbytes case framework to chart our process progress. The case framework is broken down into classroom, access, skills, and environment. And we use that data framework to compare to other districts in the region, the state, and the nation. And we've seen tremendous amounts of improvement in all the categories. The second photo uh, on the slide is actually one of the first Google Meet sessions at Eden Hall uh, back in March of 2020. Just you know, thinking about our progress over the last 14 months, we were able to develop and eventually build a hybrid model that had never existed before and then was eventually duplicated by other districts. Other districts, as we were building our hybrid model, had reached out and said, how are you doing this? And that was you know, a feather in our cap because we had never done it before. We were building the plane as it was flying and as some of the teachers had said. And so while over the past fall, while some districts were struggling with COVID closures, we were able to leverage technology and provide a consistent hybrid education model. And at various points through the day, we had over 350 streaming classes going on. So three, you think about the average home having two students or three students and sustaining three classes. We were sustaining 350 streaming classes all at the same time. I'm tremendously proud of the last year and, and everything that has been accomplished by our team. A lot of things could go wrong, but a lot of things went right too. So we've been very happy with how things have went with technology. Good evening. Um, I am going to kind of review some of our long range financial planning and our financial performance um, that we've had over the years. 
We are committed to fiscal responsibility and long-range planning as a key initiative as part of our strategic plan. So again, even though we go through the process of developing the strategic plan, portions of long-range financial planning are operational in nature, but we are always strategic in the decisions that we're making. We want to ensure that all of our decisions are not made in silos. So any um, you know, large building projects that we have moving forward, or if it's an educational program, it all ties together. Um, as part of our bond refunding process, we have extensive conversations with bond rating agencies. They do an independent review not only of our financial performance year over year, but also our financial management practices. This does also include the systematic process that we go through for board policy review. I do recall that, you know, I have been here for many, many years, but also our financial policies kind of sat with an approval date of 1994, which would have been my graduation year. So <laughs> just a little bit of funny in there. Um, what is great, though, is that we do have, again, that process to ensure that all of those policies are consistently reviewed and continuously updated for each section. Um, our successes for financial, um, you know, or our financial success is evidence in not only in our finance committee meetings but also in our general fund budget documents so you will see that not only listed on our website but as mentioned already uh, later this evening the school board will be approving the proposed final general fund budget again that does not necessarily mean that that's the final budget but it does put that out there it puts it um you know out for public review we try and make sure that we are as transparent as possible with all of our financial decisions um, we have only had one tax increase in the last seven years specifically aligned for capital maintenance and as finding a way to help support all of the details in our 10-year capital funding plan um, the general fund budget as of now for next year does not include a tax increase, but again, that one tax increase that we did have in seven years has really done a lot to help support not only our buildings, but all of the technology infrastructure that Sean just discussed um, and any of our you know, long-term assets. We continuously do an evaluation of third-party services, and that does include board member engagement as well. So this includes everything from print copy management to transportation, um, propane, food service, audit services, just to name a few. Um, we continue in our educational programming and our student engagement to focus on excellence, and that is supported through our financial planning through the budget process. But we also actively manage that each year. So a, a budget is basically a plan, but we have to be able to adapt. So you'll see in the picture that's kind of like a, of a classroom. Obviously, during COVID-19, by the time we had approved the current year budget, it was far in advance. It was right at the very beginning of, um, of the pandemic. So we did not have a plan at that time for the need for all of the long-term substitutes that we need to bring in this year to ensure that our hybrid model um, is successful. So what we've been able to do this year is be able to adapt and go through a lot of our operational line items, reduce that spending to ensure that we're not going to go over budget. So we've been able to cut back in a variety of operational areas, um, as well as all of the bond refundings that we did last summer um, that obviously had an impact on our budget as well, in addition to the one that we just concluded uh, recently. So speaking of bond refundings, again, part of what we have been trying to do is to reduce our debt service as an expenditure, um, as a percentage of expenditures in our budget. So by doing that, we again have a multi-million dollar capital funding plan that we have been able to help support all of those projects by not incurring additional debt. So overall for the community, that brings down the overall cost because any time that you're going out to borrow for some of those projects, you have borrowing costs, you have interest costs over time. So we have made a strategic effort to try and not only bring down our debt service, but also continue to invest not only in our, our buildings, but our athletic facilities, our technology, and our infrastructure. So that actually would lead me into the next but slide. Before um, you go on there, so just as, again, a, a practical example, 
it would be wonderful to know everything we know today about COVID-19 last July, but none of us had the ability to, uh, to do that. When we approached the board with using our mission to drive a recommendation, we asked the board for support for 14 long-term substitutes. The purpose of those long-term substitutes was to not only uh, provide the PRVA, the virtual academy for students that Mrs. Guerin talked about, but also to sort of backfill and still have the same amount of staff K to three. And we identified specifically kindergarten through third grade because of the early literacy, numeracy, the foundation that happens within uh, those age levels. And so that decision was able to be made clearly, quickly, uh, with strong rationale, even though it had significant cost. We, we ordered voice amplification systems so that te in all of, for all of our classrooms so the teachers wearing a mask could communicate in a normal speaking voice and project that voice to the students that were out there. So those are two examples of expenditures that ballparked at what? 1.7 million that were not a part of that initial budget plan. But at the same time, we've reduced expenditures by being thoughtful back to last August on ways that we could reduce or postpone certain expenditures in order to be you know, budget neutral by the end of the year. And so as we close out the, the 2021 fiscal year, you know, it's not, it would not be our expectation to exceed budget based upon the need for long-term subs and other things, but rather to, to find ways strategically to make that all work. And so again, that, that's an example of the way the board is able to work uh, with all of the data and information to make decisions to support students. Also another key piece that has come up recently is a lot of the federal funding that the school district is receiving and we're trying to make sure that we are thoughtful in how we invest in long-term assets with that federal funding. Um, we have tried to not only route to student devices, staff devices, again the voice amplification systems have been in there. Um, future federal funding we're going to be looking at trying to help offset some of the costs for our HVAC improvements at some of our buildings as well. So we're really trying to ensure that those kind of one-time federal grant funds are not going to cause us to have an operational hole in the next few years. Um, in this picture, you'll see uh, a picture of our Richland Elementary Auditorium. That is one of our projects that we have been able to um, fund and improve over time. Our capital funding plan actually had expanded from somewhat of a five-year, and it was a very low dollar amount at the time, um, to a very detailed 10-year capital funding plan. It not only covers um, building systems, so again, that's your roofs, your HVAC, uh, plumbing, paving, all types of utilities, but also technology infrastructure, which includes cabling, servers, it can be phone systems, announcement systems in each building. Athletics and activities has been a variety of different things, all leading back to the um, athletic facilities plan that we did back in 2016. And that not only covered um, this campus, but it also covered the Richland Elementary campus as well with the fields and the facilities over there. Um, our capital funding projects have been addressed through the operational budget without incurring that new debt. Um, so even when we're looking at the budget this evening, you will see that there is a budgetary deficit that, we're, that we are planning for for next school year. Um, that deficit right now is at about $1.2 million, but it is entirely routed to the high school gymnasium project that we are going to be looking towards. Um, a piece of that funding for that project is this would be year two of the funding in 21-22. So to be able to use assigned fund balance for capital improvements makes logical sense to try and help offset the cost of that project over a three-year period so that we are not incur incurring additional debt. Um, and again, as I have mentioned before, that's kind of been our long-term goal is to not only bring down the debt that we currently have, but to try and avoid um, additional borrowing for those projects and at this time I'm going to turn it over for safety and I, I want to go back you know one of the things you highlighted is that that one tax increase years ago but I remember it um, sometimes they are necessary mm -hmm. if we hadn't done that we'd be issuing bonds to pay Correct. for these gymnasium we'd be paying interest on those bonds um, 
you know, thinking strategically about, but carefully and critically about a tax increase yields some advantages because you can spend less money then on debt service, interest, et cetera. And I know that was implicit in what you were saying, but I really wanted to highlight that uh, as well and draw it out. Thank you. So Mrs. Kirk just spoke to some of the improvements that we've made to buildings, and one of those relates specifically to safety and school culture, and that is the third bullet on this slide, which is the mouse traps that we've been able to install as entrances in each of our buildings, um, and even some additional barriers where there had been more open areas of the building to try to close down if we would need to, in an emergency situation, the ability to respond in that manner. So that's one additional way in which we um, are looking at how finance and things come together with long-range planning um, in order to improve our facilities. In addition to that, that, Mr. Stobner spoke to a lot of the technology upgrades um, and our infrastructure has been improved overall uh, within technology, but that also is now able to support additional monitoring systems and security cameras across our campuses um, to give us additional eyes on the entire footprint um, of our campus uh, should we need it and also in order just to monitor uh, where we are with things. Pictured on this slide, you actually see a town hall um, that was held around um, safety and um, emergency operations. And we talked with the community, and there was strong support at that point for a school resource officer, um, as well as multiple other measures. And we described our entire process in terms of responding to things um, as we are able. Clearly, parts of the emergency operations plan are not public knowledge um, for obvious reasons. Um, but we were able to, to work with um, the Northern Regional Police Department in order to put an SRO in place. And this is is um, Officer Nowashelski's first year um, in that position, and things have been going extremely positively um, with his support and his connection even to the kids within the environment. Um, the go-to example in my mind is walking down the hall on a spirit day and seeing him also in uh, the clothing, um, it's whether tie-dye day or whatever it may be. He tries to connect with the kids and, and be as accessible as possible. He's also helped us tremendously in terms of uh, being able to support us when we had needs, um, things that might involve um, threats, weapons, et cetera, that we would typically liaise with an Northern Regional Police Department. He is right here um, to be able to speak with and make those um, a seamless, um, easy transition. In addition to that, um, Ms. Dr. Paxan spoke earlier about um, the health and safety pieces in terms of responsible reporting, being able to support students with the resiliency model. And we now have a safety curriculum that we embedded K-12, uh, where we're teaching students each of these aspects. So that involves things like the responsible reporting, um, but also recognizing um, you know, threats, uh, where they might categorize, signs and symptoms of um, that someone might um, need a little bit more of adult assistance, things like that. So we've embedded that in um, developmentally appropriate ways throughout our curriculum. And of course, we talked about um, Ramsway and really how building a positive culture, if we can start there and teach the kids explicitly what we expect from them and also reward it, celebrate it, it builds a much better school environment and climate for all students involved. So um, this represents that aspect of safety and culture. And on the next slide, we even think about the ways in which the pandemic was a piece of our emergency operations plan, but a page that we had not oft referred to um, prior to this year. So something that it lived there, but um, now takes on a whole new meeting. And we have really learned a lot as we've referenced multiple times in, in each of these presentations um, this year. And so there are pieces of our responsiveness to COVID that will continue into the future, such as the technology um, utilization and the ability to leverage. We can have people remoting into um, this meeting, for instance, to help present, et cetera. So we're very proud of that. And it's led to the redesign and that transforming the future leadership council and all that we're doing um, to prepare for the coming year based on the work that um, PRVA had done this year and what we had learned um, through our ability to respond you know, flexibly and agilely to everything that has um, unfolded. So the communication systems, the ability to, as Dr. Miller presented at the beginning of the meeting, have transparency into the number of cases, the quarantine counts, et cetera, um, how all of that process has evolved over time um, has just been extremely impressive. And we're looking forward to the future and what it brings in terms of learning, but also the processes that we have improved as a result. And Dr. Miller is going to speak to that uh, next in terms of the pursuit of excellence. So, how, how's the onboarding going? Um, you know, the reality is, you know, we're all, everybody's busy with life. I mean, it's just is the way it works. And we have not done something like this in years where we captured in a slideshow the areas of specific focus and what's happened over the last five to eight years. So we did that, again, given the short timeline for, for the position to which you were appointed, uh, and sworn in, 
but it's, it's amazing to sort of look back and see how each of those areas of focus has, uh, has progressed. The new category is the pursuit of excellence. So that's the bottom book in the stack of five books. And that's that idea of continuous improvement. The picture here is a full board recognition. So the Pine Richland School Board was recognized by the Pennsylvania School Boards Association for a couple of things. One of those is sitting in front of you uh, at your seat, and that's the decide model. So this decide model is a manner of engaging in the civil discourse that Mr. DiTullio talked about. One of the things that happens before the civil discourse is an incredible amount of homework. So our board members read a significant amount of information in order to walk into the room prepared to have discussion about it, to, to get updates, to probe on questions, and then ultimately, when appropriate, to act, to decide. And if I asked everybody in here, for example, the last E, who, who takes on the role of elevating the people and circumstances uh, that demonstrate the ideals? If I were to ask anyone, they would all say, Mr. DiTullio does, even in an example of disagreement that he described earlier. So the ability to engage in that discussion, to engage in conflict, but to do so in healthy ways that are focused, again, on the compass and map of who we are is really what this is all about. One of the other things is that in the strategic plan, there are building goals and the board has goals. So we heard about that a little bit earlier. Annual training. The board engages in annual training to not just meet requirements, but exceed it. And the board has a training program that's been approved by PDE and was either the first or second in the entire Commonwealth of Pennsylvania uh, to be approved. Self-evaluation occurs based upon key principles in order to drive continuous improvement for governance. We do a cycle of policy reviews that is unlike anything that I'm aware of in public education. So no policy at Pine Richland reaches a place where it's more than five years old because we go through what, are, what we now refer to as batch policy updates to review and, and even if there are minimal changes, to look at those and to work on ensuring that the policy manual is active and up to date and then the administrative regulations are there as well. School visitations. We heard an MTSS example earlier today. We've seen Ramsway in action. We have seen in-depth program reviews in action. We have seen M MTSS. We've seen so many things directly from the strategic plan through visits to all levels. So high school, middle school, elementary, uh, we, uh, Eden Hall, primaries. We, we've seen all of those over the years as a way to connect with what's happening within the schools. Key partners. We've got tons of them. And whether it's Pine Parks and Rec or A.W. Beatty Career Center participation or the AIU there's, uh, or legislative liaison, Dr. Meyer, you know, there are uh, all of those other things that I think that, um, again, just slip the mind of many because it's hard to understand exactly what it is um, that happens at a governance board in a public school district. The last is the Mid-Atlantic Alliance for Performance Excellence in Baldridge. And that's a framework to help organizations of all sectors improve. That's something we've been committed to. And you could feel it in the last, however long this has been, hour. I mean, it has its roots in all of, all of that work that's been happening. There is no mystery about what we have been working on at Pine Richland. I mean, it is... It's in the strategic plan. It's on the website. We're focused on it. It becomes the basis for our committee meetings. Typically, on a Monday night, we have a 7 o'clock board meeting, usually a 6 o'clock committee meeting or joint meeting or subject matter area meeting in order to do and engage in all of this work. So all of that ties together uh, in where we are. We understand what we do well, but we also very clearly, we very clearly know where we need to get better. And a lot of the things that you've seen on the slides are because of weaknesses and opportunities for improvement that existed before. And then how do we tackle those in a way that's going to help improve what happens for students? And, and again, students are, are the foundation of that. We talk about the, if you showed the green loopy loop, 
to our staff, they understand what that is. And that's the idea of continuous improvement over time, getting a little bit better at all of the things that we do. It would be wonderful if continuous improvement was a straight line, but it is not. And so the loops represent mistakes, opportunities to learn, refine, and get better. We are acutely aware of results, academic measures, financial measures, satisfaction measures of all of, all of our students, staff, and, and parents. We look at all of that every year in order to make decisions and improve what it is that we're focused on. And again, those things live together the, the more and more we work on it. Bottom of that, every student every day. Every is the word. And again, so this, this sort of strategic plan update of five to eight years just gives you a sense of what has been the work of governance, of leadership, of our staff, input of our community, voice of our students. It is all tied together um, in how we're moving the organization forward. It is not one person. It isn't 500 people. It is more than that as we have chipped away and continue to focus on doing better things for kids. So uh, we're, again, excited to share that with you today. I don't know if anybody has the energy for questions, but if you do have them, we'll be happy to address them. Everyone knows me, so obviously there's questions. One's a comment. I'll make that first and then a quick question. So first of all, I just want to go back to, to technology. This also ties in with my other question about you know uh, staffing and human resources. But the administration has done, uh, in my opinion, an incredible job of um, I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. Uh, we have lightened the staff of administration significantly um, uh, in the past eight years. We did not get rid of any un unnecessary jobs, but we found ways to be way more efficient. But there have been times, um, uh, Dr. Justice is one example, and Mr. Stobner is another example of when we needed to add. And I wanted to point out the ad that we made in 2015 with the director of technology was in hindsight the only reason why we were able to get to where we got to with the one-to-one -one technology and with the virtual learning without that move i can only imagine how crippling that would have been if we were in the same mode that we were in that in 2015, it would not have been possible. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and Greg, if I may, it's not just the addition, but it's finding the right athlete for that job. Uh, absolutely, agreed. It was, um, again, we don't, we don't do you. that without, and I know it's a team, I get that, but without that move being made, we don't get to where we were. And I did have just one quick question. When, you, when um, uh, Mr. Glickman, you were talking about the individual uh, professional development plan, um, is, is part of that just, just developing within the position, or is this, because if, if, it's, all five, if it's 520 staff, so 500 answered, uh, we're talking pairs, we're talking you know, everyone throughout. Uh, is part of that a where do you want to be in one year, three year, five year, i.e. looking at pairs that may want to teach, looking at teachers that may want to be administrators? Is that part of that plan and that developing? To an extent, but not, not really longitudinally like multi-year. So an individual professional development plan is, is presented on an annual basis, essentially aligned to areas of focus for that particular school year. Um, and so there's, there's different headings. There's like, you know, district goals, building level goals, departmental goals. Um, there are absolutely options for personal goals. So somebody, you know, to um, use the example you just said of like a paraprofessional who aspires to become an educator they could absolutely put that in but that part's not um, a, requir a required piece of the template um, as much as it is an opportunity to sort of um, as I identified earlier like what am I going to focus on this year to improve my practice and how it does all the work I'm working on connect to the larger um, goals of the organization that's being considered because I look at yeah it's in the know. strategic plan yeah. so okay. yeah so yeah. career development progression we have a number of leadership opportunities in different places and so as an example we elevate certain paraprofessionals to engage in district level work we have teachers who function as so there are different opportunities for that but that is also one of our places to improve it's it's in the map as well too. oh it is for yes, sure you've yeah. mapped that out very nicely yep. over the past two years
Any other questions or comments? Uh, it it does feel almost overwhelming, but there there are so many connections. You can you can search for some of those terms and see the detailed presentations that people referenced. Um, just tremendous. So thank you, Dr. Miller. But thank everybody. Thank everybody on the line uh, for your portions there and uh, for the past five to eight years. And that's what it is, right? Yeah. Great stuff. Thank you. We do have some voting items tonight, and uh, Mr. Kashani, I I see strings of numbers that need to be read, and I I feel like I'm taking your thunder. Could you read item 3.01 uh, for us? Sure, Mr. Lyons, my pleasure. So item 3.01 is the motion to approve the advertise the advertisement of the proposed final general fund budget for 2021-2022 school year with total expenditures of $95,958,177 and total revenues of $94,712,288 with a utilization of assigned fund balance for capital improvements in the amount of $1,245,889. Second. The motion's been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? So I just want to comment that our original deficit was 1.9, and it has been brought down to the 1.245 uh, million. So it's great. <laughs> Thank you. It is still in process. And yeah. I will continue to uh, process additional changes uh, between this evening and June 7th when the final budget will be available as well. It's a lot of change in the couch cushions, Dana. <laughs> some rocks. Some, some, big rocks. some big rocks. Yeah. yeah. Good job. Any other discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 3.02. Is a motion to approve a memorandum of understanding between Pine Richland School District and Crisis Center North as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. <clears throat> Item 3.03 .03 is a motion to approve the student attendance and application of the student discipline code for trip requests to PIA state championships for spring sports 2020-21 school year as listed. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 3.04 is a motion to approve the personnel items as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 3.05 is a motion to approve in accordance with policy 109.1 .1, library resources, the weeding of Wexford Elementary library resources as attached. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 3.06 is the second reading of miscellaneous batch policies. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Item 3.07 is a motion to approve a renewal agreement with Sodexo with a guaranteed financial return of $100,875 for the 21-22 fiscal year. Contract language should be negotiated with the district administration with final approval from PDE. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor say yes. 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 Opposed? 
Motion carries. Finance, Mr. Kashani, back to you. Thank you. So item 4.01 is an informational item that at the regular meeting in uh, this month will approve some financial reports and accounts payables. And item 4.02 is also informational that we will approve some budget transfers. And then lastly, informational 4.03 will also approve at the regular meeting the A.W. Beatty budget. That's Thanks, it. Mark. My pleasure. Mr. Tulio, Buildings and Grounds. Item 5.01 is uh, an information item on athletics and activities uh, facilities update. And this is something that stemmed from our athletic survey that we did in 2017? 16. 16. Mm -hmm. Jeez. It's five years old already. Um, <laughs> is that going to Dr. Pasquinelli? Take that. And we do have a uh, slideshow. I'll probably take about an hour with this, if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, um, we just are compelled to highlight the why and the what in terms of our athletic and um, activity study, as Mr. DeTulio just mentioned. Again, back to engagement of people in making these determinations and thinking strategically to do so. So this first slide, is just who we are. You know, we had to know who we were in the past, who we are now, and looking to the future and think strategically about that. So even before thinking about a study of spending that type of money on facilities, we had to look at things like demographics and feasibility, because we had to think about our building capacities and where we're going to be long term able to sustain. And if that's, a, that's good to go, then we can start thinking about athletic and activity. So Again, strategically thinking about that, we identified Wexford down the road was going to be an area where we'd need to make some shifts. And lo and behold, here we are, and we've made some shifted, shifts at Wexford, um, and that's happening next school year. Next slide um, talks, again, link strategically. So this, as I mentioned earlier, um, all we do is guided by this map of a strategic plan. So this, this particular initiative around studying athletics and activities and how we can enhance for not just our students, but our entire community is thoughtful through the strategic plan. So you can see the links in the first strategic plan in the first four years and also in the current strategic plan that we're in. Next slide is, again, Dana had mentioned this, Ms. Kirk, about uh, long-term planning. So a lot of school districts, you'll hear about a one to five year plan. Uh, early on, we were talking about six to 10 years long-term. What does that mean and what does that mean financially and what does that mean in terms of impact on programs, people, kids, community, and that's what this study was, was all about. Uh, next slide uh, it identifies an example. So an example, this um, high school was built. Uh, at that time, 600 students in the high school. So the, the gymnasium at that time was fine. It was perfect for that size. Now we, we average about 1,500 students in our, in our high school. The, the gymnasium doesn't hold the entire student body, so it limits some of the opportunities for us to do some really cool things for, for our entire student body in, in the gymnasium. So we see that as an example of something. We really had to study and understand when, how, and what. And in order to do that, as we've been sharing, if you go to the next slide, it's about collaboration. So this, this next one says we have multiple groups of people. Board members, as we mentioned, Greg was highly engaged in this. Other board members, as they were available, as they always do, came into the process to provide feedback, um, coaches, athletic trainers, of course the director of athletics at the time, an architect, uh, finance director. I mean, so many people are engaged and then periodically what do we do? We stop and pause and we ask community for input. So we had two town halls to gather input from community in making these decisions for what should we do about facilities to support our community. Next slide talks a bit about how did we make those decisions because you start generating recommendations from all those committee meetings and town halls and, and follow-up um, conversations. We crossed out anything that was a hard slog because it was too expensive and it wasn't impacting a lot of people. Everything we landed on 
was about as many people as possible be engaged in this, in this community and in, in this school district. Those are the ones that lifted to the top of our priority list, and there were some quick wins that we were able to get in there as well. That drove our decision making. It drives our decision making when we do an in-depth program review as well. It's about what impacts the most people um, and where we're going to spend the money uh, that makes the most sense. If, next slide. I'll pause there again just to look at some of these images. So these are projects that are completed. The locker rooms are redone because we learned from our coaches that they teach in the locker rooms different than when you and I grew up, where you went in and you just changed and you left. There's teaching that happens in there, so we opened up the space. Now there are display boards in there so they can watch film and do things like that. Storage is always needed, so you can see there's a storage facility. But before we ask for storage, we ask to clean up, just like your basement. We've got to clean up, and then we'll buy something new. You can see the um, trainer, the um, new visitor's locker room, which is on the um, field side, the other side of the, uh, of the stadium. That, again, additional locker room space for teaching. It's got a trainer's room that is on field level, so that there's a sight line there. You can see the image that's from the trainer's room. If something happens, trainers are on spot and ready to support kids. Uh, it balances the needs for male and female programs because we want to make sure, again, we have equal access for everything and facilities matter. So that's all part of that um, new visitor's locker room. And then you can see an example there, Richland Elementary School. Dugout seems pretty simple, but you need a dugout if there's weather emergencies and we want to align what our softball field looks like to our baseball field. It just, it just makes perfect sense. Next one. You can skip. Go to the next one. Okay, images that were completed in 1920. So uh, we have plans for making significant modifications to our main gym, but short term, what could we do in order to enhance the experience for so many people is we could resurface the floor, you can see that, and we can paint the walls. So it's brighter, it's lighter, and, uh, and, and it's an opportunity for a lot of people to in, and continue to engage in that main gym as we prepare to do a more significant project. Softball field's awesome. You can see a picture there. So spectators now have a beautiful view of this facility. We updated batting cages. We made modifications there. The biggest thing there was drainage because, again, we didn't have the opportunity to play as many games because of drainage issues. That was addressed. So now we have more competition and practices happening on this field, not just for Pine Richland athletics, but community opportunities as well. Baseball field examples there resurfaced, took out all the sod, and now they've got a nice new infield. The warning track has new the crushed brick. And again, that's just improving the um, playing experience for our kids and for our opponents. They go to the next one. You can skip. Next one. Um, obviously, we're super proud of the ram cage. Uh, hopefully, every time you drive by, you see people engaged there and different people. So our, our PE teams are using that all the time for so many new and unique ways. Obviously, all of our athletic teams are on it. Um, ROTC goes out, there, goes out there to use that facility. Um, and again, when we think about it, one of the main reasons we wanted it is because there's so many people engaged in activities here at Pine Richland that you'd go by the stadium at 10, 11 o'clock at night and there's still kids out there. That's a problem for learning. So now we have additional facilities where kids can get on earlier and they can get home earlier so they can get to bed and, and be ready for learning the next day. So those things we don't talk a lot about, but they're an important part of facility modifications. Um, gorgeous new turf. The turfs match each other, so you practice on one, you compete on the other, and you have that similar experience to get our kids ready to, to compete at a high level. Uh, go ahead on to the next two. And then, again, quickly look into the future. We talked about the renovations to the green gym. Uh, we've shared that in the past recently with the board. Again, um, we, we move forward in that project. We can have three phys ed classes happening at the same time doing very different learning activities. Um, awesome. W a place for our wrestlers, place for any activity that you can think of because it has a high side, a low side, it has a fitness room upstairs. And why are we recommending that? Because we're recommending the, the significant modifications to the main gymnasium to bring our student body in there, bring our band in there. You've all been to some of the concerts in the band. Um, to, the, to be able to have something in that place with more people in, and have more space is just awesome. And then some of the summer projects this summer on the right hand side, um, new timing system for the swimming pool, uh, new um, scoreboard for the swimming pool, and returfing the, um, the tennis court. So just, just awesome stuff. 
uh, we continue to think about that action priority matrix. What are those things that impact the most people? And we do that in a fiscally responsible way with the support of this board and community. Uh, we wanted to say thank you, and uh, we look forward to the future with that stuff, too. Anybody have any questions? All right, um, before I go through these individually, I'm going to move that uh, 5.02 through 5.0, no, through 5.11 will be uh, consent agenda at the next meeting, if no one objects. <clears throat> Mark's favorite words. All right, item 5.02 is approval of uh, Custodial supply vendors for 2021-2022, and we'll have a motion to approve the purchases through CoStars at uh, the companies as listed. Item 5.03 is uh, information on a 2021-2022 colored paper and oversized white paper order, um, and we'll have a motion to approve the purchase through the colored white paper through WB Mason Company, um, uh, also through uh, priced through CoStars. Item 5.04 is um, uh, a motion will be made to approve the uh, 10 classrooms at the high school uh, to be re-carpeted by um, Franklin Interiors in the amount of just under $40,000. Item 5.05 um, will be a motion to approve uh, two John Deere zero turn mowers and one gator six by four vehicle from West Central Equipment, again through CoStars, at a cost of just over $34,000. Item 5.06 will be a motion to approve uh, high school paint and middle school uh, refresh painting services. Um, those costs will be filled in. If anyone does have a question before the next meeting, we could pull that from the consent agenda. Item 5.07 uh, will be a motion to approve the purchase of new furniture for the middle school library. And again, those costs will be filled in. If anyone has questions, we can pull from the consent agenda. Item 5.08 um, will be carpeting at the uh, library for the high school um, as part of the refresh project. Again, costs to be supplied. Uh, item 5.09, um, secondary campus paving and concrete repairs. Um, we'll have a motion to reprove, approve all those. Again, costs will be submitted. Item 5. Point, oops, sorry. 5.10 uh, is Wexford paving, uh, Wexford Elementary paving and concrete repairs. Again, uh, I believe Mr. Zimmerman will be providing the cost on that. And item 5.11 is tennis court resurfacing. Uh, that will be at the high school at a cost of $235,000. Again, um, as these are filled in before the next meeting, I would just encourage everyone to look over those costs. If anyone has any questions, we'll pull whatever anyone has any questions on. And does anyone have any questions on any of that? And I, I would add, Mr. Zimmerman, thank you. He's on the call, so he joined in if there are any questions. Yep, that's it. <laughs> Dr. Meyer, academic achievement. Item 6.01 is an information item, and it do not need to read all of that. <laughs> um, <laughs> essentially, the basic facts process that has been unfolding, we are mm -hmm. at the point where we are now making a recommendation for your consideration for voting at the next meeting. Um, the data points on the most recent evaluation component um, and, and input from the community is there. You will get next time the executive summary as a PDF as well. So there's lots to that. Um, the, the next item is similar to that as well. Dr. Pasquinelli helped lead that process. And I would just say to uh, Mrs. Hayden, this is another example of how that resource review piece that we were speaking about in the presentation comes to life um, here. Yep. And then item 6.02 is what Dr. Jess was saying about is the biology, academic biology and honors 
informational I, I, um, informational item. Dr. Pasquarelli, do you have? Right. Okay. Unless there's questions, I think that's that we've been talking about this for the last yeah. few months. Thank you, Carla. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Swope, Student Services. Thank you. I have four information items as well. Item 7.01 is the um, for board consideration at the next meeting. Motion to approve a contract with Dr. Dominic Montella as the designated school physician for the 2023 to 2024 school year. Um, Essentially, he just finished his first cycle of contracts, um, and we're it's up for renewal every three years. We have our mm -hmm. school physician and the next item, the dental contract, aligned now um, in, in that cycle. So both Dr. Mantella and Dr. Chips, who will be on the next agenda item, are continuing essentially in their positions as well, just for background. That's great. Item 7.02 uh, for the next meeting. Motion to approve Dr. Chips. Item 7.03, um, to motion to approve 2021-2022 uh, Adult Foy Education Services Agreement as attached. It's an annual renewal. Services are available to students um, as needed. And item 7.04, um, pavilion donation for Wexford Elementary. We will, um, motion to accept in accordance with board policy 702 and with sincere gratitude to Wexford Elementary School PDO, a donation for a Cedar Pavilion um, valued at a total cost of $19,000. I've seen the pictures, it looks really beautiful and it's gonna be a great opportunity for the outdoor lessons, so thank you. <coughs> that is something I hope stays, more, more outdoor meetings. Mm -hmm. I love the food service, 9.30 on a Tuesday, dial in for, for, you know, so other things we can keep. Maybe we can have a July meeting there at the pavilion sometime. Mark will be racing the sun and we can get out of there. <laughs> Mrs. Swope, I also wanted to thank you for stepping forward and uh, being our student service governance area lead. Um, so that, that went without uh, mention by me previously and I apologize. So My pleasure. Thank you for doing that. Staff services, Dr. Mihalik. Thank you. Item 8.01 is an information item. It will be a motion to approve personnel at the next meeting. And item 8.02, also an information item, a motion to improve a list of employees for the extended school year for the summer of 2021, which will be attached. Thank you. Thanks, ma'am. Mr. Moy, operational services. Sure, all four, four of these are informational. The first one, 9.01, this is gonna be a motion to approve the memorandum of understanding between uh, Pine Richland School District and Northern Regional. The next one is 9.02. This is gonna be a motion to approve the 2021 and 2022 emergency operations basic plan for the Pine Richland School District as attached. Then 9.03, this is going to be a motion to approve the proposal from Kristen Van Streen for E-rate consulting services at a cost of 4,000. And then lastly, item 9.04 <clears throat> is gonna be a motion to award the bid for the uh, liquid propane gas. On the MOU with the Northern Regional, sure. explain to me the one-year, two-year cycle thing. So we, we want to get back online, so we did a one-year. Do we have to do every, a two-year? Can we do a one-year? Would be one question. You're required to do it at least two years. Okay. Thanks, Matt. 
On operational services, with the exception of possibly the MOU, would uh, everything else be okay to put into a consent agenda? I think that makes sense, yeah. And I was also thinking of some of the um, uh, student services as well. Um, I don't see any that I personally wanted to pull out, but I didn't know if anyone else did. I just It's a big donation. Let's keep the donation. Okay. Out. Yep. I want to think about that summer meeting, too. Okay. <clears throat> Anything else under operational services? Item 10.01 is just informational item, a reminder that we uh, will approve or reapprove our board treasurer. Um, Mr. Kashani has indicated his willingness to serve again. I'm grateful for that. I think we all are. <clears throat> Thank if you. anyone else would like to serve or run, uh, we would vote on that treasurer position. So please let me know or, or Barb know. Item 10.02 is hard to believe, Mark, even a bigger honor is to reappoint Ms. Williams as our board secretary. Greg spoke so eloquently previously about the many ways that she serves us with integrity um, and devotion uh, and caring. She keeps us on track. Uh, these volunteer jobs could not, could not be administered effectively without Ms. Williams' support in the central office. Um, so thank you so much. Item 10.03 is information for consideration at the May meeting, a motion to approve the PSBA policy maintenance program. Slightly different change, although essentially uh, we have relied on PSBA in one form or another for uh, policy uh, maintenance service uh, for quite some time now. Item 10.04 is a reminder of joint governance meetings. Um, that's our new word. I mean, committee, mer committee meeting rolled off the tongue a little bit better, and we'll some time talk about that history. But the joint governance meetings uh, that are coming up are the diversity, equity, and inclusion topic scheduled for May 17th at 6 p.m. And we're going to focus on the educational model transformation and transition on June 7th, 2021, and August 2nd, 2021. All those are scheduled for 6 p.m. prior to regular or planning meetings of the board. So even for those at home, it's worth mentioning the, the transition there in our language to joint governance, um, because we have found some of these topics that are better dealt with in the what we would call a committee meeting. So there's more back and forth in the committee. There's not official action. Uh, and sometimes we would shoehorn them into, is this, this is operational service, this is student services, this is staff. We found it, it's just easier to sort of say what it is, um, which is really a, a joint meeting of the governance body to come together and explore an issue in more detail. Uh, thus the language. And as always, like our committee meetings, public is welcome and uh, the entire board is welcome, more than welcome, encouraged. So, you know, Peter, you had used a term, governing lead. I like that term. We had uh, been using kind of subject lead as a, uh, instead of a committee chair, we had said subject lead, but that, that just, to me, kind of falls flat a little bit, or just, I like, I like the governing lead. I, I don't know about everybody else. Governing or governance lead? So it would be like the academic achievement governing governance lead? I had to look up subject lead when I mentioned Ms. Swope. So if you catch it now and we change it to governing lead, there's still time, yeah, because I have not <laughs> learned the new one it's just yet a, I mean, it, from it committee really, chair. It really explains the position to me because we have the, the um, subject lead in administration in the SLT or whatever, you know, that's really, they're the, uh, I say the experts or the, that. They are. Where we the, are. Yeah, and where we're not we are the subject is, matter expert, that's for sure. We're just, right. we, we were kind of like, where do we do is falling over the meeting instead of using that committee chair thing, uh, term, because we really, in meeting with all of us, we really like when all of the board members can make those meetings and encourage, we encourage that and not have just committee members 
as as the old model was. So I, I it was just a thought when I heard that. It was like I like that the governing lead. It really seems to explain that position. Let's uh let's ponder it. If there's any feedback, I'll mention it in one of my updates and uh, you know see if it rolls off the tongue and we can make that switch mm -hmm. in the next couple of weeks. I'm sure Barb's thinking, oh, no, we have to go back to <laughs> policy. <laughs> she's, thinking, she's thinking all the places she is subject where governing won't fit in the, the right. title anymore. And item 10.05 is a reminder. Uh, the board SLT workshop scheduled for July 12th, 2021. I was going to mention it. You guys were tearing through so fast. I mean, frankly, there was a lot there. Um, and I think it was you, Dr. Justice, and, and you who mentioned, you know, we, we, we're aligned. Along with this, the strategic plan, come periodic, repetitive calendar cycles that are points for reflection, points for, for goal setting, um, points for recalibration. This, and when it takes place, is very deliberate, very intentional. Uh, Dr. Miller and I talk about it a lot. We talk about it as a group, and, and we do have a fairly mature and established calendar for when that happens. It is at a time during the summer when the embryos of planning have developed a bit, uh, but it's early enough for the board to, to reflect and give input to change course, shift direction uh, somewhat heading into the, to the near. And hopefully the demands on our time are also limited enough so that we can really pause and reflect. So. Reports, Chris, yes. I know you have a prof. Yeah, so for prof, um, so I attended the prof uh, meeting uh, online on April 26th, and prof is continuing to work on their strategic plan that was also going on in the last meeting as well. Um, so they're making great progress in that area. They also have the scholarship window has now closed as far as receiving applications. They received 222 applications uh, from graduating seniors. And then those, there's going to be about, uh, actually it'll be over $30,000 that will be awarded. There's still two scholarships that are outstanding. Um, the Blood Drive Scholarship, that's usually kind of late. I remember that from when I had done that, worked on that um, as a community coordinator, that that would always come in a little bit later. Um, and then the Rich Mar Rotary was still being, uh, waiting to hear how much that would be. Um, and uh, then in grants, they have, they awarded two FAST grants, uh, and the FAST grants are uh, grants that are less than $1,000 so that the grants committee can approve it, doesn't need to go and wait for the whole board. And they've been, they did quite a few of them uh, last school year, and this, this school year they've done four of them, uh, and most recently two, the Story Walk at Hance, and then the Project Runway. I don't know if you wanna say anything about the Story Walk, if you know about that, Dr. Justice them together um, as a K3 team and thinking through that, but essentially they're installing um, places where you'll be able to pause and read pieces. So you're actually getting the physical movement, the mindfulness piece, as well as the actual story that is there. So the, the team's mm -hmm. been working together on that. Right. And then the runway, the project runway, which I know used to be something that was a uh, really more of a in-person idea with the, um, that was done as fundraisers uh, really around the country, but now it's a software um, apparel design with CAD so yeah that one um, again real innovative thinking from our family consumer science staff um, again typically you think about CAD software you're thinking about engineering and technology integrating that into family consumer science and allowing the students to learn how to use the software to develop their you know their own apparel design is just really awesome so we're going to be going into an in-depth program review for family consumer science this is a chance to pilot some yeah. of that software mm -hmm. in advance of that program review it's really that's that's yeah. exactly where prof hits perfect for us because it allows us to explore a little bit as we're studying it's it's mm -hmm. just perfect right so it's a great partnership that the school that the district has with prof uh, so they've also done two full grants this year I didn't um, have the names of those offhand but uh, and how much they were which I can always report at the next meeting but uh, so they they really are a key partner with us so just real quick on that. So collaboration 2.0 room from the middle school was one of them. If you guys recall last year, they approved the collaboration room. That is a, um, the design of that room was around gifted education, gifted and or highly achieving 
students. Mm -hmm. We um, came up with that concept for flexibility of learning in the classroom, but not just for that group. Now it's going to expand to all students at the middle school. Uh, our gifted ed teachers uh, really have learned how to utilize that room, even in this era of COVID. Uh, the flexibility and design provides so much opportunity for all, all kids and all um, teachers. And from what they learn, they're going to be there to support other teachers bringing kids in. So now more materials coming in through the second mm -hmm. prof grant. Again, that hasn't been approved, but that's kind of the overview of the grant. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. And that's it. Thanks, Christine. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other board member reports? Administration? I I would like to say a word about Beatty because um, I won't get into details, but today we received information that they actually have a waiting list of students for the next year enrollment in certain, um, in certain classes. And um, as part of the Beatty Awareness Committee, I'm, I'm very excited about cooperation with, with that school. And I think it's important to, to spread the information in our middle school students uh, because they offer excellent programs, variety, and um, I was reading how many scholarships the, the baby students actually received, not only earning college credits, but they actually getting scholarships for the, for the college, or some of them are exploring their passions, and they are basically employment ready from day one after graduation, so this is a great resource. And Chris and I, we participate in the joint committee meetings, and it's also a great way to cooperate with eight other school districts from the North Hills area, um, unfortunately virtually for the last, last year, but um, this is where we can also exchange ideas and, and cooperate. So just want to say that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, virtual meetings of Beatty, that's not a net gain. The culinary arts students not making you dinner is a, yeah. <laughs> it's a real loss. Yeah, yeah. Um, Peter, I've got one thing real quick, because one of the callers earlier had mentioned something about debrief. That's something that we do at our work all the time, and you got to put your ego aside and you got to own it. So I've been thinking about some of the things I said, and I had a huge note here that I absolutely missed, and I want to make sure I clarify this. Um, and I got to own it because it was a screw up. So, and, and it was not an excuse, but it was a passionate something that was very passionate to me that I was talking about. But one of the things I do want to say is that the number of emails and the traffic that has come through is I don't know what the number is, but it's massive. The vast majority of those have not been attacking. They've been critical. They've been probing. Those are OK. What I was referring to is the small minority that are the attacking. And I want to make sure that, that that's clear, because from the football families or the families in the um, community in general, I'm not talking about the masses. I'm talking about the few. Um, and that's where that has been coming from. And a lot of them have been repeat offenders. When they send an email, there's a number of emails. So I'm talking the number of people that have sent emails, the number that have been attacking have been on the minority side of things. And I wanted to make sure I said that. I also wanted to point out, and, and I forgot to mention, that what I have been very impressed with is when we've gotten communications from students and student athletes, they have been unbelievably articulate, thought out, and civil discourse. So I need to make sure that, that, that I say those things because what I said could be misconstrued that I'm putting a group of people all together. And that's not what I was trying to do. I'm trying to talk about the specific ones, like the individual who would send us an anonymous to our homes. Um, that's the kind of thing I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the masses. So I did want to apologize. I screwed up. I got to own it. That's on me. No mission is perfect, I think, is what the caller said. Anytime Greg speaks, it doesn't go perfect, because I don't typically write things down. I make some notes, and I, that was a note that I absolutely missed in the heat of passion, and not an excuse, but I missed it. So I just wanted to clarify. Thanks, Greg. Any other reports from the board 
or administration? Mr. Serber, do we have anybody in the waiting room? I don't see anyone. Seeing how there is none, uh, the board will adjourn to an executive session to discuss a personnel matter. Have a good evening, everyone, and a good week.